Good evening. Welcome to the Northampton City Council meeting of March 20th, 2014. Uh, worth noting, the first day of spring and the first council meeting we've actually been in a long time where it's still light out. Um, before we convene, uh, the council has established in its, in its rules this time to be set aside um, for public comment. And anybody can speak on any topic uh, of community interest. And there, but there are a few rules that we require that you keep to. Uh, when you speak, when you step up to speak, please uh, state your name and address for the record. Please keep your remarks to under three minutes. There's a timer here that will count you down um, and show you how much time you have remaining. And, and then please close at or before the three minute uh, mark. <coughs> it is possible you could be ruled out of order if you insist on going over the time. I don't. It's fine if you're finishing up a thought or a sentence. That's fine. You don't. It's. But when you start a new thought, new paragraph, something along that line, I'm. I will ask you to please uh, finish. Um, the counselors are expected to listen, and pay attention, but they are not allowed to speak during uh, public comments. So any questions you ask, uh, they won't be answered at that time, and they'll be considered essentially rhetorical. And then also please abide by uh, the decorum of the proceedings uh, by speaking with conviction and respect, and refrain from, you know, mentioning or critiquing private citizens by name or address, and that includes employees of the city, but all elected officials were fair game. You can call us whatever you want and maybe invent something new that we haven't heard. That would be exciting. Uh, among the items that we will be discussing and or deliberating tonight are the uh, early on there will be a hearing for, on the petition of the Northampton Business Improvement District to amend their fee structure. That hearing will be to those points only. Those will accept testimony in favor and opposed based on the amended proposals. Uh, then we'll also have a presentation by the Board of Public Works uh, on the forestry management plan for Northampton's water protection areas around our reservoirs and no vote associated with that discussion will be taken. Uh, and then it's also the second vote for the establishment of the Stormwater and Flood Control Enterprise Fund and, and its fee structure. And then we also will be considering transfer of funds to legal services and the parking garage. Uh, there will be a number of proclamations and everything else, but I suspect that most of you are here for one of those items that I just mentioned. So to start off, um, Anthony Patillo, please. Anthony Patillo, Autumn Drive, Florence, Mass. Trust, charter, and the laws. Leading up to this ordinance, there were several open meetings to the public. It was, there was a doctrine that was proposed of a cap of fees collected of $2 million for five years. This was proposed and put out there, and a lot of people supported that because of the fixed incomes that they're on, because of the override that just passed. They needed to be able to budget what they had to, to pay. The council voted for, for <coughs> this. And at that meeting, one of the counselors said, well, there's rules that have been broken, specifically Rule 36, which stated that at or before the meeting of the council of the ordinance, the ordinance <laughs> committee, city solicitors shall review for form and legal character. Not done. February 25th, three votes unanimous to support with a, an approval to go to council in which it was then passed for the first vote. I, I don't understand how the trust can be kept. This is like me going in for a five-year loan at a fixed rate, going to sign the papers, and then being told at that time, no, this is an APR, these are the new terms, and by the way, the terms we told you before were illegal. I, I don't a lot of citizens don't appreciate this. The, t the money that is going, the $2 million for this, in 1940, the city went into an agreement with the federal government to, after the <coughs> dikes were built that they would maintain, with, maintain what was built. Said in that agreement that you shall devote funds to make this happen and to follow the rules and standards. It wasn't done. 
So 70 years later, 65 years later, we're now told that if we don't get these things that are our lack of maintenance are, aren't done, we will take you from a minimal acceptable rating to unacceptable, and if that happens, you're not going to be able to get flood insurance downtown. That should have been done with tax dollars, and now we're putting in place a fee to do this. This just isn't the way that we should be doing business. This doesn't bring trust, and there clearly are issues with law that are going on here. And you guys, I hope that you listen. I really hope you listen, because this is not the way to do business. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Paul Walker, please. Paul Walker, 52 Gilrain Terrace, Florence, Mass. I'm here tonight as a concerned taxpayer who attended many of the BPW task force meetings where they were charged to put together this report. Over 50 pages. I wonder how many of you have actually read this. I'd like to express these comments. I see a similar process in the handling of this being put together in similar to one put together in our nation's capital by a committee of nine members and some elected officials which was called the Affordable Health Care Act. One which is already affecting me and perhaps some of you and will more. You may recall as it was being discussed a comment along these lines was spoken. After you approve it you can read it and find out what's in it. It's amazing. It's amazing. It's amazing that I, s I see incidental on page 10 of this report where it says, and I will quote it, this may be too complex for the citizens to understand. I wonder how many of you really understand it. Without a doubt, it is a very complex and two-part financial issue. <coughs> One part is intended as a helpful solution for city drawers, sewers, drainage, and infrastructure. The second part related to the city's operation and maintenance for flood protection. If you have read this city manual, it is mandated, and this is the flood control one, which ties in dramatically with this other report. How many have read this? It is tied in by many financial obligations, which should have and have not been meant. Physically maintenance, long past due, presently past, and for the present, I don't see how we can afford to do them. I support paying my share, but tell me what I'm getting for $2 million. When watching TV of the city council meeting on March 6, I was dismayed again by the process. Even two legal minds exchanged interesting questions and answers. I was waiting and expecting, as other taxpayers have told me, more discussions, debate on the issue pertaining to the subject such as what as if, what are we getting to accomplish? Do we have a painted item, do we have a printed itemized plan which projects where this money is going? What are our priorities? I believe a letter in our current flood plan indicates that the Board of Public Works should give us a reason and a printed program for where the money's going. I urge you to ask them. You're signing a blank check, and when you sign a blank check, that you should have you should have checked before you sign. Mr. Walker, a signature on a check means responsibility and accountability, and I'd like to have some. Thank, thank you very much, Mr. Walker. Thank you for my time. Uh, Richard Brzezowski, <coughs> please. Hi, Richard Gazowski, 64 Nonatuck Street in Florence. 
Over the past few months, the Northampton Department of Public Works and Board of Public Works have made many compelling presentations for the need to upgrade and maintain the flood control and stormwater distribution systems in the city. The means to pay for these upgrades is before you tonight in the form of the Stormwater Enterprise Fund, which will raise $2 million exclusively from property owners in Northampton. There are many people and businesses who are not property owners, but who will benefit from this maintenance, including the city itself. Historically, the city has paid for stormwater work through appropriations from the general fund <coughs> to the tune of $250,000 to $500,000 each year. Under the, new general, under the new enterprise fund, the city will be contributing nothing from the general fund. I want to repeat that. The city will be contributing nothing from the general fund toward this enterprise fund. As you're aware, only 68% of the general fund comes from real estate and property taxes, with the remainder coming from other sources, including state aid to cities and towns. <coughs> By approving the Stormwater Enterprise Fund in its current form, you're saddling Northampton property owners with yet another assessment on top of the recently passed override, increasing water and sewer bills, and the annual 2.5% automatic property tax increase. While this new assessment may be a couple of hundred dollars each year, to many people that amounts to more than petty cash. By exempting the city from paying into the enterprise fund, you're essentially giving the enterprise fund a $250,000 or more increase by transferring its maintenance burden to the new enterprise fund. Before approving this new tax on property owners of Northampton, I urge you to reduce the $2 million cap on the enterprise fund by the amount the city has historically budgeted for flood control and stormwater maintenance. With the recently announced increase in local aid figures from the Gazette here, maybe it's possible to reduce the property owner's burden even more. Thank you. Thank you very much. Barbara Rokoska, please. <coughs> Good evening, and thank you very much for allowing us all to speak. I am Barbara Rakaska from 571 Florence Road. I'm urging the council to not do a second vote on the stormwater um, fee. One, I have gone to meetings, and so have a lot of other people, and you need to relook at this. Um, there were last minute amendments that the public did not know about. So the public feels like they were told one thing and something else is thrown at them. Also, it went to four tiers from three, which does spread the money around. But how can we believe a range of $61 to $85 for small parcels, right? And that's a big jump, 61 to 85 a year, when you don't even know what the rate of the fee is going to be yet. I have not heard what the rate is going to be. So how can we say how much it's going to be? And yet you're going to vote on it. I do think that the public needs to come in and be told more before you do a second vote and allow it to come through. I don't see how you can vote on an unknown. It would be nice if we could have some more public input and meetings. Thank you. Thank you very much. Emory Ford, please. My name is Emory Ford. I live at 364 Spring Street, Florence, Massachusetts. On March 6, the Northampton City Council approved an amended proposed ordinance creating a utility for stormwater and flood control. The vote was taken despite several members testified they had not received the amended ordinance in time to study and analyze it. The vote was taken despite it violated one of the council rules on deliberation. A key element of the original proposed ordinance created a utility for stormwater and flood control with a provision to cap <coughs> expenditures for five years. The amended ordinance makes the cap uncertain, both in the first five years and subsequent years. In the many hearings held in Northampton prior to the vote, citizens 
were led to believe that the ordinance would contain a cap. I believe Northampton needs a continuing source of funding for stormwater and flood control. <coughs> However, I strongly believe that the enactment of an ordinance should be done in a way that the council members have adequate time to reflect on the ordinance before passing it and to ensure that the public understands the ordinance prior to a vote. Further, the City Council follows its own protocol with respect to the passage of the ordinance. To do less is, in my opinion, irresponsible governance. Tonight, you have the opportunity to reconsider your actions of March 6. The citizens here tonight and those at home have expectations of you for responsible governance. Thank you very much. Uh, Rick Clark, please. Hello, my name is Rick Clark. I live at 84 Williams Street. I sat on the stormwater task force, and, but I'm here as a concerned taxpayer. For decades and decades, resident property owners have carried the burden for paying for 83% of all stormwater work in the city <coughs> based on property taxes. Engineers tell us that stormwater management is specifically about impervious surfaces. The stormwater and flood control ordinance is amended, as amended is unfair and inequitable because it appears the business, commercial, and nonprofit property interests in this city have exerted questionable and undue influence on the process. This is a shell game and has resulted in an ordinance where these sectors will not pay a fee equal to their actual impervious surfaces. This is mostly because they have cleverly succeeded in insisting that city property and open space be counted into the equation. <laughs> despite the logical and political questions still surrounding these choices. Chicopee, for instance, does not do this, and they have the oldest stormwater utility in the state. Oh, and a budget surplus. The City Council Stormwater Task Force was to be an advisory group of 12 members, one citizen selected by each council member from their ward, one each appointed by the council president and vice president, one representative from the Chamber of Commerce, one from the BPW, and one from the nonprofit community. However, the Chamber of Commerce and presumably Councilor Specter felt it important and necessary to have not one but two members of the Chamber's very own and quite formidable Stormwater Task Force to sit as voting members on the Citizen Advisory Task Force. And surprise, surprise, now we have an ordinance strongly endorsed by and basically written by the Chamber of Commerce. I wonder why citizens are even asked to participate when the process seems like just so much busy work or lip service. Although we met more often than the Charter Committee, we were not given any ethics instructions and we did not take any oaths. You might want to look into how you construct and oversee future volunteer citizen advisory committees. So let's see, if the city is billed from now on for 10% of the utility, only property taxes will pay that bill. And we know businesses pay only 17% of property taxes. Homeowners will get to pay 83% of that stormwater utility bill for the city. So why is that? Why would you defer to the Chamber of Commerce and allow them to include city property into this ordinance? Wow, maybe it's because certain insiders recognize that the commercial and tax-exempt properties percentage of total impervious surface drops from 31% to 24%. And well, let's just go for it and baffle everyone at the last minute, if I may have one more minute. Um, My wife will finish reading okay, she signed that, up after that would, me. That would be fine. Yes, Rick, go ahead. Thank you. With this rarely used hydraulic acreage formula, I imagine the Chamber f Task Force thought, shoot, if we can build more farmland and recreation fields and open space for stormwater runoff, that means smaller bills for parking lots. It is really not that hard to understand. It is very easy to argue that this ordinance will come back to bite us, in large part because it is so alarmingly short-sighted by you, our elected officials, 
what exactly are we going to do with that general fund line item when the news of more mandates and unforeseen problems caused the stormwater utility budget to double or triple or worse? When will we need, will we need an override for this line item? So, By Rick, um, I'm sorry to interrupt, but I mean, um, because we have a lot of people here tonight, I have uh, more sense. reasonable expectation to speak. I, I, That's fine. I My wife can finish that. reading and, this. It's important you hear it. And I do see, uh, coincidentally, that Marcy Clark is next up on the list here, so I suspect that you guys can tag team here. That's what the plan is. Okay. okay. Where did you leave off? Hi, Marcy Clark. I also live at 84 William Street. Um, will we then need an override for this exploding line item is where he left off. By enacting this ordinance, <coughs> you will be setting up an unfair system where tax-paying property owners are charged twice once through the prop enterprise fee and once through the general fund for this, same fee for this same line item. In effect, homeowners will be subsidizing Chamber of Commerce members and clients by having an ordinance requiring that homeowners carry a heavier and heavier load. Some of this would be easy to correct by passing an amendment removing the city as a stormwater utility fee payer. Okay. <laughs> Thank you very much, Martha. Okay. Um, Jasper Lapiensky, please. Hello, my name is Jasper Lapiensky. I live at 226 South Street. I'm aiming for the shortest public comment I've ever done tonight. Um, it's not about the stormwater ordinance, that's why. Assembled councillors, Mayor Narkowitz, if you can hear me somewhere, doesn't the idea of vibrant sidewalks miss the point a little bit? You can't make sidewalks pretty if they don't exist. I'm sure the residents of River Run would love a vibrant patch of mud along Damon Road. Is there room in the budget for some vibrant, almost got hit, ankle twisting potholes on Florence Road? Perhaps PVTA would split the cost of a vibrant, not a bus stop by the Look Park Rotary. If there's money for vibrancy, it should be used to offer access to more people rather than to offer aesthetic amenities to those who already have that access because the most vibrant sidewalk of all is a plain sidewalk that has everyone on it. 57 seconds. Um, since I have a little <coughs> bit more time, I would like to uh, just interject into the um, complain fest. I think that this ordinance is a very good ordinance. I think it's been well studied and I think that it could have been a lot worse than it was Thank you for doing something about it because nothing, doing nothing was the only alternative that was proposed and uh, that would have been tragic in the sense that the city would become unlivable within 20 years. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Phoebe Sessions, please. My name is Phoebe Sessions and I live at 17 East Street. <coughs> and uh, my understanding was that tonight the mayor would be reading a proclamation naming March 2014 as Social Work Month. So Dean Carolyn Jacobs and I are here representing the Smith College School for Social Work as we partner with the National Association of Social Workers, which has designated this year's theme as All People Matter. We wish to express our appreciation for the mayor's acknowledgement of the significance of social work in this proclamation and to briefly bring to the community's awareness the resources which social work brings to Northampton <coughs> and the Pioneer Valley. Some of the very important themes identified in the proclamation are based on the foundational values of social work, including the promotion of social justice, a commitment to counteracting the effects of poverty and trauma, which unfairly restrict human potential, support for diversity through recognition of the equal value of all people, engagement with clients at all stages of life to enhance their capacity to master a range of health and mental health challenges, contributing to safe environments and enriched education for our children, attention to the range of needs experienced by veterans and their families following years of service to our country, 
and access to health and mental health care based on current theoretical and practice knowledge. There are 42 full-time social work interns from the School for Social Work. They constitute 17% of our student body of about 250 who are in field placements across the country from Seattle to San Diego, from Maine to Atlanta. Here in Western Mass, our interns are working in inpatient mental health settings where they provide clinical social work services to patients and families as part of interdisciplinary teams. They are working in public school settings where they are providing intensive counseling support to troubled children and families, coordinating with teachers, and using knowledge of child mental health issues to contribute broadly to the educational mission. They are providing in-home therapy services to children and their families in which teams of professionals and interns can address multiple needs in a flexible outreach format. Representing a core mission of the school, which was founded during World War II as a part of Smith College's commitment to the war effort, our interns work with veterans and their families through VA settings. So that's where we at the School for Social Work are and we thank the mayor and the city council of Northampton for this opportunity to bring these services to the attention of our community. Thank you very much. Uh, Alan Scheinman, please. Are you, you were I, um, accidentally signed okay. the general sheet when I only meant to understand. Sign. That's fine. You'll, so you 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 want to be in the bid testimony? Yes. You want to speak in the bid testimony? Okay. Deb Jacobs, please. My name is Deb Jacobs. I live at 82 Grove Avenue, Leeds, and I want to get back to the um, stormwater management. Um, I, I think it's tremendously important that um, more attention be paid to it. Like everybody else, it's going to be hard for me to um, come up with the money. But um, one of the things that I would really hope is that the city um, itself would um, take um, stormwater management uh, more seriously um, with the buildings that they have. I went to a, an excellent program at the Lilly Library last year that was put on by the Pioneer Valley Regional um, Planning Commission. Could you, I'm sorry, Deb, can you yeah. speak up? Some people are uh, saying they can't hear you. Okay. So. Can I have a couple minutes back? We'll give you, I'll give you, I'll spot you some there. Okay. Um, I went to an excellent uh, program on um, <coughs> stormwater management at Lilly Library last year that was offered by the Pioneer Valley Planning Commission, and I'm hoping that the city will um, do some educational projects because there's a lot more to putting in a rain garden or putting up rain barrels than um, the average person realizes. And in terms of the city and what I'd like to see is when Pulaski Park is redone, I would like to see stormwater management take uh, a major focus because you've got those roofs from Memorial Hall and the Academy of Music. You've got some mature trees that um, hopefully will stay. And I think the city needs to help lead the way in terms of what can be done um, in terms of uh, promoting uh, stormwater management. Um, I'll leave the whether or not it's fair, the process that you've used um, for other people to comment on because I haven't really followed that. Um, I also would like to um, comment briefly on the uh, forestry pro program that's um, being currently done that you're going to be um, apprised of tonight. And I think it's unfortunate that it sounds like it's losing some money, um, and uh, especially at a time when we're being asked to um, put money into a new enterprise fund. Um, and I, I hope that that was a misprint in the paper. I also <coughs> would like to say that I was, I was disheartened to hear that hemlocks were being targeted as a tree to come down because of the woolly adelgid. It is an organism that the state is taking very seriously and that we won't be able to eradicate, but hopefully um, there'll be a balance. And hemlocks are just too valuable as both a signature tree and uh, a wildlife habitat um, for us to be uh, targeting them as they're gonna die anyway. So I hope you'll 
give all of that some thought. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, <coughs> Richie Kozer, I got that right? I'm Richie Corza, 35 Lindsay Road, West Hatfield. Uh, I have a house in Northampton and all my uh, frontages in Hatfield. I have no services from the city of Northampton except the tax bill. I don't mind paying my taxes, but this year alone, Proposition 2.5 override, along with a CPA tax, which goes to a lot of jobs, probably this money does not apply to. Uh, I think the city officials should tighten their belts to too much foolish spending. None of this helps us on Lindsay Road. Thank you very much. Uh, Molly Hale, please. <coughs> Hi, I'm Molly Hale at 96 Oak Street in Florence. And I'm here to speak in favor of the forest management plan. Um, uh, in full disclosure, I'm a wildlife biologist, and I contributed um, sections to that um, plan. I, I contributed the wildlife habitat assessments, the vernal pool assessments, and the invasive species assessments that are in that report. Um, there's good forestry and there's bad forestry. and. Uh, this is not bad forestry. This is good forestry. And uh, I feel that it's not only acceptable but necessary in order to protect the um, quality of the water and the integrity of the forest. Um, it's not a high grade, which is when you remove all the good trees and leave the yucky ones, leave the poor quality trees. Um, these, uh, in fact, in this plan, the best quality trees are being left there. Um, there are not clear cuts <coughs> involved. Um, the largest openings are only three quarters of an acre, which is really not very big. Most of the openings are even smaller than that. Um, and they're dispersed among a matrix of uncut area that is um, uh, left just as is. So um, uh, it's not a huge extensive area that's being cut as some of the critics have sort of implied. Um, the purpose of it is to protect water quality primarily. Uh, and it's important in order to do that to keep a forest of tall, uh, healthy, vigorous, and um, diverse species of trees. And that's what the, what the uh, plan is aiming to do. Uh, it's up against several different um, challenges. Um, this forest has a lot of problems that, are, that set it apart from just sort of a natural, um, pristine forest. Um, one is that a number of the species, including <coughs> hemlock, um, beech, and red pine, are already really severely impacted by, um, by uh, introduced insects or fungi. Um, there's almost a complete lack of regeneration, which means young trees growing from seed. And that's just mostly due to browsing by deer and, and moose, which are not, moose can't be hunted in the state, and um, deer can be, but I guess they're not hunted very much up there. So they're eating almost all the uh, regeneration. Um, and there's extensive presence of invasive vines and ferns, which exclude anything else from being able to grow up through them. So because of those challenges, it's, it's not just sort of a pristine forest that you could just leave alone and expect that it's going to um, um, continue to provide <coughs> the functions that it does now. Um, I basically urge anybody who hasn't read through the plan who's you know involved in this issue to at least read through the overview part which is the first 40 or so pages it gives a very clear idea of what the um, the what's the why's and the how's <clears throat> how's behind what's being proposed and why thank you thank you very much <clears throat> Glenn Ayers please hi my name is Glenn Ayers I live in Greenfield um, thank you very much for allowing me to speak at this forum I'm Totally ignorant of the stormwater issue, but I did come to speak about the forestry on the watershed properties. Um, I'm speaking as a private citizen tonight. No one paid me to come here. And I'm a soil scientist. I have a BS and an MS in soil science. I'm a public water supply operator, and I read the plan. Uh, let me just say that 
This land was purchased with public funds in order to protect it. That's why it's called Watershed Protection Forest. And it seems obscene to me to then sell off the public's resources uh, at a loss, essentially, when the whole purpose of setting this land aside was to protect it from exactly this kind of destruction. Uh, there would be nothing that I could think of that would be happening in watershed lands that would be more destructive than putting in roads, skid trails, and cutting down the forest. Even in small patches, you still have to bring in a lot of roads. That opens up the area to a lot more invasive species, which is already a severe problem in the watershed. And it does not solve any of the problems with the so-called diseased and dying trees because a natural healthy forest needs lots of dead, diseased, and dying trees because that is part of the ecosystem. So I think that the idea of setting aside watershed protection lands, the most highly protected lands in the state, and then not allowing citizens to walk on that land, to even take pictures apparently, the mayor recently forbade a whistleblower from stepping foot on the property or taking any more pictures to show what was happening there. And then to turn around and allow industrial scale logging operations to go in, diesel equipment, petroleum products, and if you read the plan, it has six pages dedicated to spraying herbicides <coughs> right in the plan. I think that that is a huge mistake and that the city has really been sold a con job by very vested interests in perpetuating the timber extraction industry and transferring public assets, the public commonwealth, to a few private hands. Thank you. Thank you very much. <clears throat> um, Jim Winston, please. Hi, I'm Jim Winston, uh, 142 Main Street, North Hampton. I'm going to try to take three, um, three minutes to talk about two subjects. I realize the, the issue about the bid is going to come up later. I, I may not be here, so I'm just going to uh, voice my support for the, for the no bid, asking the council not to take any action on the bid's request while there's two active lawsuits that are um, being uh, adjudicated in the courts concerning uh, that issue. So I'd ask uh, respectfully. <coughs> Council does not uh, take any action on that. The other issue, totally unrelated, is is about the parking garage. And I'm a leaseholder, been for several years, and uh, I, I I know the city has sold way more leasehold passes than our spaces down there. And that's normally not a, a problem. We can park in the rest of the garage. However, the garage has had had many issues this past winter. We know about you know when there's snow on the fifth floor, they lose spaces. We know about the recent issue with the tickets that made the garage say full when it really wasn't creating backups and uh, so I had actually I, I think I reached out to uh, City Councilor O'Donnell about this issue uh, about I think if you have a leasehold and you're paying $90 a month you should be able to display that on your car windshield and park in any of the lots in the city and, and to the mayor's uh, office credit they did for a period of time inform the leaseholders that during this time where the garage had those parking issues that if you put the uh, the leasehold on the dashboard you would not get a ticket if you parked in Maple <coughs> Armory lot. So what I'm asking the council to consider, my uh, my position is that this should be a, a permanent understanding or, or ordinance within the city that if you are a leaseholder, no leaseholder is going to intentionally park in Maplewood um, if they could park in the garage. but. There are other times where the garage is full, especially around the holidays, and it, and I think common sense would dictate that if you're paying ninety dollars a month, that with that leasehold card, that you should be able to put down your dashboard, and you should be able to park in any city-owned lot without um, having a ticket. As I said, I recognize the mayor's office did make that exception, but that was a limited exception, and and then we were told that now we had to go back to the old ways. So if you are a leaseholder and you come in and the lower part is full, as it often is Monday through Friday, and then the rest of the garage <coughs> is full, now you have to pay for parking instead of being able to use your pass. And I, I just, 
I think the intention should be is, is that those people that are the dedicated uh, holders of those leases, that they should be able to park in any lot on a permanent basis if the garage is full, not as a first option. And I'd, I'd ask the city to consider that. Uh, thank you for listening to both points. Thank you very much. <coughs> Tim Pachark, please. Hi, my name is uh, Timothy Pachorek. I'm from Linseed Road. Um, here to talk about the water runoff also. Um, I, I didn't totally understand the bill until I talked to one of the city councilors, which uh, was very helpful to understand a little more about it. Um, but I still have um, uh, mixed feelings on it, uh, mostly to the not wanting it. Uh, like my other neighbor that was up <coughs> a little while ago, uh, he's also on Linseed Road. Uh, Linseed Road is a is a, ro a public road, but it's ma um, owned and maintained by the city of Hat or town of Hatfield. Uh, little town of Hatfield maintains the the waterways, the gutters, uh, supplies the water to us. Um, basically, everything comes from the town of Hatfield. Um, I've never seen a, a city of Northampton truck on that street fixing the road or helping out with any of the water problems we've had in the past on that road, which we've, we have had many that the uh, town of Hatfield has fixed. Um, I do understand that uh, the bill is also has to do with the, uh, <coughs> the flooding controls, the dams and that in the city of Northampton. Um, however, none of that would affect us over on the Linseed Road area over by uh, know over on the north end of, of the city um, so I'm still against against the tax um, I'd be on the higher amount around the, the, the $239 um, per year it all yeah. adds up my uh, taxes are are over 8,000 already I think a portion of that should more than cover any type of uh, issues with uh, any of the streets further into the, into the center of, uh, of uh, Northampton um, and that's it Thank you very much. Um, that's it for everyone who signed up. Is there anyone who's interested in speaking at this time? And I would do this with the caveat that the, the bid hearing, we're, we're keeping the testimony to <coughs> the amendment, the proposed amendments. Uh, if you want to talk about the, the, the concept of the bid as a functional entity, that's something completely different. We're speaking about the three. Uh, structural amendments for rate change if it might be more appropriate if you want to speak more holistically now would be the opportunity because it wouldn't it would not conform to the uh, hearing process just so we're clear and if and and you can speak on any other point too <laughs> I just I still hope Hello, my name is Norma Akamatsu I live on Crescent Street but more importantly I'm a clinical social worker renting office space at 151 Main Street for almost 30 years. I, and I came here to bring attention to the situation of therapist renters like me, who presumably will feel the burden of the bid fees during a period of the long decline of our own reimbursement rates. My chief concern is the mandatory nature of the fees, I feel the bid improvements are more relevant to retail and restaurant enterprises than to those of us perched above Main Street um, with smaller profit margins. And if I ran the universe, I would dissolve the current bid and create a different type of organization that would not fall under the state directive for mandatory participation. Thank you. Thank you, Norma. Peter Teitelman, and I live at 11 Kensington Avenue, but have an office in 53 Center Street. Basically, I'd just like to agree with Norma's comments. <coughs> uh, I don't think that we had a really good chance to look at this for people who aren't uh, selling things. I'm a psychotherapist. Uh, I don't think it's fair. We do our own snow removal. Uh, we're not, we don't want more people. Uh, coming in from out of town particularly we it won't help our parking it doesn't seem fair uh, I also want to uh, agree with Jim Winston's view to not go ahead on this until the two suits that are active uh, are decided uh, thank you thank you very much 
Alan, do you want to speak now? Um, I think so, just because um, I have some general comments about the bid. That's fine. Why don't you come up and identify yourself and sure. then uh, <laughs> yours. I'm Alan Scheinman. I live at 50 Fairfield Avenue in Holyoke. I'm a property owner in downtown Northampton. And the last time I was here, uh, City Councilor Narkowitz uh, and others told us that if we didn't like the bid, we could opt out. That's no longer true. Um, once the bid re uh, votes to renew itself, all of us who opted out, and that's 61% of all property owners, will be forced into bid membership against our will by a minority of property owners. This proposed modification tonight is to make the bid seem uh, more palatable when it forces us into mandatory membership in a few months. I, for one, don't trust the bid management at all. Whatever they change now can be changed back later. Remember that these are the same bid people that swore that membership in the bid would always be voluntary. Now it's mandatory. Remember these same bid people used residential condominium unit owners to get the bid adopted. Now they want to eliminate these same owners from membership in advance of the vote that will make bid membership mandatory. <laughs> Maybe they um, are afraid of how that group will vote now. And remember that these same bid people claim that they were unhappy that the recent amendment to the bid law would make membership mandatory. But, in spite of that, they rejected our settlement proposal that would have kept the bid, but would have prevented mandatory membership. This minority of property owners represented by the bid wants to force the majority into membership. They are for a reduction of bid fees only because with the addition of fees from all of us who will be forced into membership against our will, they will have more money than they have now. The bid is proposing changes to both the original bid petition and to the business improvement plan that was contained in it. For the record, I believe that Mass General Laws Chapter 40-0 Section uh, 9 um, gives the City Council authority to approve a <coughs> change in the current business improvement plan, but does not authorize any change to the rest of the original bid petition. There are two lawsuits pending. One challenges, one challenges the establishment of the bid. The other challenges mandatory membership. The first suit is going to trial next month. The City Council needs to table any actions relating to the bid until these lawsuits are determined. Thank you very much, Alan. Uh, is there anyone else who would like to speak at this time on any topic? Jordy? Yourself <coughs> and state your address. I'm Jordy Harold, and I live at 3 Massasoit Avenue. And I just want to essentially echo the points that Alan brought forward, that um, I was, went to many meetings as the bid was being established, and I'm friends with a lot of people who um, are active participants in the bid, and the whole tenor of those discussions was that this would be a voluntary organization, and so please don't oppose us in our effort to create something together. And we're now found uh, X number of years later being uh, potentially forcibly swept into that situation which doesn't sit well and that was language that was echoed at the the council level as well so uh, at least at the very least until these uh, lawsuits are heard I'd ask the council not to take any further action but I mean I think in in general as li living together as a community and considering uh, how these things that that the bid does seek to do get get taken care of that we need to to look at look very carefully at, at how that might be structured. Thank you. Thank you very much. Anyone else? Eric? 
Good evening. Uh, my name is Eric Schur. I own a number of properties within the bid and within uh, the area of downtown Northampton. And I just want to uh, echo what both uh, Jordy Harold and Alan Scheinman had, uh, had stated, that when uh, we spent um, a number of, of days in front of the city council as this bid was being discussed, um, I think the one main thing that everybody heard as they made their votes on the council was that this wasn't going to be a mandatory situation, that we could all opt out. And here we are now, five years later, where the language mandatory is being forced upon us, and we're all going to be part of, if, uh, if this moves forward, we're all going to be part of a bid um, that, that um, when the votes were taken, um, many of the councilors basically voted because the bid, in fact, was going to be voluntary, and they felt that those that wanted to opt out were not going to be hurt. So we have two suits um, that, are, uh, that are now uh, in front of the courts, There's a state suit and a federal suit. Um, we have a suit that's being heard next month, and I would urge the City Council to table any action um, that's in front of you now with regard to the Northampton bid and, and what's in front of you until such time as both of these cases um, have been heard. Thank you. Thank you very much. Anyone else? Going once, <coughs> twice. Uh, I'm going to ask the Secretary to call the roll, please, and we will convene. <coughs> Here. Present. Here. Present. Here. 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 Okay. Um, I'm going to ask us to move a little bit out of order. We have a scheduled hearing, but we also have a proclamation. And rather than, I mean, we're honoring these people, not punishing them. And what I would like them to do <laughs> is to have the opportunity to. Uh, be acknowledged before we move on with the proceedings. Your Honor. Uh, good evening, uh, Mr. President, members of the City Council. Um, it's my uh, pleasure this evening to issue the following proclamation designating the month of March 2014 as Social Work Month in the City of Northampton. Whereas the primary mission of the social work profession is to enhance human well-being and help meet the basic needs of all people, especially the most vulnerable in society. And whereas social workers know that poverty and trauma can create lifelong social and economic disadvantages and that discrimination of any kind <laughs> limits human potential and must be eliminated. And whereas social workers stand up for individuals support diverse families, and help people in every stage of life to function better in their environments, improve their relationships, and solve family and personal problems. <coughs> and whereas social workers believe in shared prosperity and opportunity for everyone, and their research and advocacy help turn community needs into national priorities. And whereas social workers are change agents who put the ideals of citizenship into action every day, and whereas social workers celebrate the courage, hope, and strength of the human spirit throughout their careers, now, therefore, I, Mayor David J. Narkowitz, do hereby proclaim the month of March 2014 to be Social Work Month in Northampton in recognition of the numerous contributions made by America's 600,000 social workers, I call upon residents to join with the National Association of Social Workers and with the Smith College School for Social Work in celebration and support of the social work profession. In witness whereof, I have set my hand and imprinted the city <coughs> seal this 20th day of March in the year 2014, David Jane Arkowitz, Mayor. And I know we have some guests here. Um, if they're still here, uh, and I they ran away. To, uh, present this to them. Norma. They ran away. She, she, she ran away. Well, okay. she made some comment. <laughs> <laughs> uh, um, uh, she made comments um, at uh, Ms. Sessions. <laughs> comments at the public comment section. So I'm sure she's grateful to have that. So thank you very much, and thank you for uh, picking that out of order. Um, we had scheduled at 7.05, as you can plainly see, we're past that just <laughs> uh, for the public hearing, and this is Ray, the petition of the Northampton Business Improvement District request for uh, adjustment of fee structure. And Councilor Adams. Do you think now is appropriate to assert the uh, conflict? Um, yes, actually, yeah. Would you, uh, Councilors have, uh, Councilor Adams, see after you. I have, I've spoken with the um, State Ethics Commission, an, an attorney there, and they've told me that I have an incurable conflict due to the fact that I have a family member that owns property in the district. I can't 
take part in the vote and I shouldn't even take I can't take part in the discussions and I probably shouldn't even be up here lest I suggest by my gestures and facial expressions any opinions I have on this subject so I'll be leaving the council table for this discussion thank you and I put myself in the exact same circumstance. I have a family member that owns property in the bid jurisdiction, so I as well have been advised to depart at this point while you conduct the public hearing. Okay. Well, we will be spared your eye roll. <laughs> I appreciate that. Um, so, we have two recused members from this discussion. Uh, let me state out front that the purpose of this hearing, as I said, is to is a petition to amend the fee structure under the charter of the, of the established bid. Um, it is, we are required to speak only to those points, yay or nay, proponents, opponents. Uh, as I said, larger issues are not appropriate to discuss at this point. Um, and I'm going to read the order <coughs> just so we're all, so you guys get to hear all the whereas's and such like. This is ordered that the petition of the Northampton Business Improvement District incorporated in accordance with Mass General Law Chapter 40O, S9, as has been cited already today, to approve the amendments to the petition to establish the Northampton Business Improvement District and to the initial Business Improvement District Improvement Plan incorporated into said petition. Both Northampton Business Improvement District incorporate, uh, I'm sorry, both approved by the City of Council on March 19, 2009, as adopted by the Board of Directors of the Northampton Business Improvement District, Incorporated, on January 10, 2014, and set forth below and concurred and endorsed by the owners of more than 51% of the assessed valuation of participating properties and more than 51% of the <coughs> participating owners within the Business Improvement District attached to the petition is filed. To amend, the petition is to amend the petition to establish the Northampton Business Improvement District and <clears throat> to the initial Business Improvement District Improvement Plan incorporated into said petition, both approved by the Northampton City Council of March 19, 2009, as follows. One, delete the first three lines of paragraph three and subparagraphs 3A through 3C of said petition and substitute the following. Three, all private and public properties shall be included within the district with the exception of residential condominiums and exclusively residential buildings with less than four units. The proposed district annual fee schedule, subject to the inflation adjustments provided in the original petition, is as follows. <coughs> A, the fee for commercial properties will equal the assessed value of such property multiplied <coughs> by 0 0.0025. B, the fee for residential and residential commercial <coughs> buildings will be equal to <coughs> Res per residential unit plus 50 cents per square foot of commercial space. C, the fee for hotels will be equal to assessed value of such property multiplied <laughs> by 0 .0025. And two, delete the first two lines of paragraph 8A, Northampton bid fees, and subparagraphs 8A1 through 8A. A3 of said initial improvement plan and substitute the following. Northampton bid fees. All private and public property shall be included in the district with the exception of residential condominiums and exclusively residential buildings of less than 40, I mean, <laughs> less than four units. Good catch. Uh, the bid annual fee schedule subject to inflation adjustments uh, provided in the original plan is one. The fee for commercial properties will be equal will equal the assessed value of such property multiplied by 0 0.0025. Two, the fee for residential and residential commercial mixed use buildings will be equal to fifty dollars per residential unit plus fifty cents per square foot of commercial space. And three, the fee for hotels will be equal to the assessed value of such property multiplied by 0 0.0025. And two, that the that, except as modified by subparagraphs 1 and 2 above, said petition and initial plan as previously updated, continue in full force and effect. And three, that these amendments will become effective on the later of the, on the, <laughs> on the, later of the approval by the members of the Nor and the Northampton City Council as required by Mass General Law Chapter 40 or July 1st, 2014. <laughs> 
I accept a motion to open the hearing, please. So moved. Second. We are now in public session and <clears throat> I invite the proponent. Natasha, please identify yourself and Hello, my name is Natasha Yakovlev. I am the recently appointed interim executive director of the Northampton <laughs> Business Improvement District. And on behalf of our board of directors, I'd like to thank you for the opportunity to appear this evening to speak with you. With me tonight are several of our board members, as well as our general counsel, Chip Doherty, who is available to answer any questions you may have about bid processes. Before you this evening is the bids request to the city council asking that you approve a rate reduction for bid membership fees from the current 0 0.005 rate per thousand to 0 0.0025 per thousand, bringing commercial property owners to the same leveled fee structure, as well as a parallel 50% cut in the fees for mixed commercial residential properties. Let me give you some background on why the bid is asking for this fee reduction. In 2009, when the City Council approved the establishment of the bid, the approval included, in the petition and the original improvement plan, the fee schedule for the bid member properties. The petition before you is to amend that fee schedule as summarized. In 2012, Massachusetts lawmakers passed new state legislation that mandates that if, a current, bid, if current bid members vote to renew the bid, all properties within a bid must become fee-paying members. The statute also provides that all bids have a mandatory sunset period that requires a member renewal vote every five years thereafter. We all believe that this provision is smart and extremely important for the continuity of the bid. It gives property owner members a stronger voice in the functions of the bid and helps ensure a high <coughs> level of bid performance. The bid currently consists of 112 fee-paying properties. <coughs> Under the new legislation that will bring all properties in, that number, number will be 279. While we want to see the bid grow, we have a good handle on what our budget needs to be in order to properly service our district. We think that reducing the rate is fair, and with new members, the budget will still grow, even at the reduced individual rate. However, the bid is not about making money. The bid is about serving its district. The Board of Directors wants to use this new legislation with its sunset clause and our new fee structure as a positive first step toward creating a whole new bid as we continue to build an even stronger connection to the community. In the past two years, we have already seen a lot of exciting economic improvements in the business environment of our neighbors in East Hampton, Holyoke, and Greenfield. Regional competition for discretionary dollars is getting tougher for Northampton, and with MGM even closer to building an $800 million destination casino in Springfield, Northampton needs to focus on ways to maintain and grow its reputation as a regional destination. We believe that this is an important <coughs> time to move forward with this bid, and this fee change will be the first of many positive steps. Thank you. Um, are there any questions of the proponent? Um, that uh, Actually, Natasha, um, I, you know, if there are any other proponents queued up, and maybe we should hear from them first, and then we can um, ask I questions. Believe, Rich, did you sign? No. 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 Could you walk us through the process, both if we were to vote no tonight and if we were to vote yes tonight? What are the next steps that would happen in each case? If you were to vote yes tonight, we would go through the, the practical process of changing our inner IT systems and changing our database to match the fee, the fee structure that is in the table that I provided. Um, we would work with the tax collector to make sure that the same information was adjusted on their end, and we would send out notifications to all of our current fee paying members, notifying them of the change that would, they would be seeing on their July 1st bill. And if you voted no tonight, we would not do any of the practical issues, but we would still send out a letter to our current members letting them know that the change was not approved. Right, and, and uh, Mary points out, and she's right, we would have two votes on this anyway, so it wouldn't pass right. at, very, at the earliest until April 7th. So there'd be a second reading at the next council meeting on the, uh, when the meeting survives the first vote. When would the meeting of the members and potential members, since it's mandatory, mm -hmm. vote on this and the continuation of the bid in general? 
The first vote that would happen is a renewal vote for current members in our board, and that date has not been set yet. And that is the vote that brings in all of the other properties into the district. Approximately, what are we talking about? Are we talking three months, six months, a year? The board, I believe the board will make that decision within the next couple of weeks. And that had to be done within a five year period? Is that yes. at the time frame? Yes, correct. Okay. We, okay. So technically, we have until 2018 from when the legislation was changed in 2012. When, oh, so it's five years from when the legislation yes. was changed, not five years from when we initially passed the legislation? Correct. Um, can I just, it, has there, have there been discussions about when that vote would take place? Certainly. Because I think that's fairly important, and I, I kind of would ha like a better sense of are we talking sure, the far out to 2018, sure. or are we talking nearer no, it's to going to happen day. sooner. The board has had many thoughtful discussions about when to hold this vote, so it is certainly going to happen sooner. They're, they're deciding between doing it this spring or doing it in the summer. Okay. Thank you. And, and I, <coughs> this is a clarification, at least based on the testimony. Um, there is a reasonable person who was just coming to this might misunderstand and think that the city is mandated. Correct. This, uh, compulsory membership. And the city has not. Fact, this is this is. This is a state mandated legislation. State, and the city is actually and in, at the time of deliberation for the original bid, and I wasn't part of that, but the fact is that the the councilors were voting on information that was laid out to them at that point, and it was not their decision and or choice. Um, to to make it mandatory, make membership compulsory. Correct. Um, Nor was it ours. <laughs> I will point out the bid. This was a legislation that changed at the state level. Councilor, and, and also just to clarify, the vote that we're taking on mm -hmm. tonight is, and the, and the next two weeks should it pass tonight is really about the fee structure. It's about the fee structure. Oh, no. It's about bringing the commercial properties, the entertainment venues, and the hotel all to the same level to a rate of 0 0.0025. Currently, the commercial properties are 0 0.005. The entertainment venues are already 0 0.0025, and the hotel has a fee structure of a per room fee. So we're bringing everybody to the same level. Um, the mixed commercial residential units are feed on $100 per unit for four units or less, and then a dollar per square foot of commercial space. We're cutting that in half, so each unit will be $50 for units four or less, and then 50 cents per square foot for commercial space. It's going to be a, quite a savings for members. Council of Arts, you have a question? Yes, thank you. I'm a little confused with this. Mm -hmm. I'm hearing tonight <coughs> that there is two lawsuits, mm -hmm. and one of them might occur within a month. Mm -hmm. What happens? If we do two votes, we do one tonight and another one in two weeks, and all of a sudden there's movement between the federal or the state courts that it's going to. Counselor, what? my concern is asking, first of all, Natasha's not an attorney. More importantly, she's not our attorney. I understand that. So, so my concern is asking her for a legal opinion about that I think that's something we should reserve for someone we pay the money to who can actually own the answer. I, not that Natasha would lie, I don't think she would, but I would feel a lot more comfortable and confident about relying on information from an attorney that, that is. Um, well, our attorney's not here, so. No, the, our city solicitor is not part of this. Uh, attorney Fitzgibbons is not present tonight? No, but, uh, attorney, uh, attorney, attorney Doherty is, is here. here. So he may be able to speak to that. But okay, just for purposes of clarification, although you know, Attorney Doherty also does not necessarily he's he's representing the bid. So just just so that we're clear on everything, uh, it, it, there is time. At some point, we would, we would certainly benefit from an opinion on that question. Your concern, as I understand, is the point that was raised a few times about the pending suits, <coughs> one federal, one state suit, mm -hmm. and. Uh, actually two different creatures, um, and whether that impedes our ability to vote on the existing and established language of the charter that already exists, um, we abide by the laws that are laid out to us at the time, not as to what's looming. So, But that's, again, I'm not a lawyer either because I wouldn't be sitting here if I was. I'd just do it for the money. So if, um, but 
I, I don't know if you have any comments relative to that, Natasha. You're welcome to. It's just with the caveat that that um, your opinion is right. Is no, I your understand opinion, that. So. If I'm understanding your question correctly, you're asking if the trial that is looming mm -hmm. has a, a negative impact on the bid. How is that going to affect our fee change? The fee change would go into effect for July 1st. So whatever happens between now and then happens between now and then and the fee change if, if i mean I, I can't i can't comment on the litigation and what's going to happen at a trial but what's happening next month i don't think pertains directly to lowering the fees for members on july 1st okay is my answer thank you you're welcome Councilor O'Donnell. thank you for the question <coughs> i'm just wondering about hotels yes because in that case um it's not just a um a coefficient that you're cutting in half is actually a new nope. kind of assessment. Mm -hmm. Now it's two hundred dollars per room, and then after, if this were adopted, it would be like other properties. It would be exactly like other properties, so they would be assessed at their assessed value times point zero zero two five, as opposed to the fee per room. Are there any major implications of doing it that way? There's, there's a total amount of money from hotels. It is, Steady. it would be less money from the hotel in fees, for sure, um, but apart, apart from implications, no. No, it's bringing everybody to a level playing field. Is it roughly half? Is Not for the hotel, no. The, the hotel, hotel is, I think, more about 17 or 18 uh, percent. Natasha, can you describe, I mean, you actually give us a handout, but I think for mm -hmm. the purposes of the hearing, if you'd describe the anticipated revenue you expect to generate from the compulsory members. <coughs> you have sure. a sense of what that would be? Sure. We have an operating budget right now of about $409,000, and that's with our current members at the 0 .005 rate. When we renew and all members are brought in at the 0 .0025 rate, we'll be working with about 510000 in our budget. And, and with that anticipated increase, does that increase services? It will. We. If you picture the boundaries or boundaries of the bid, we're currently working within a certain footprint. So a significant portion of that increase in our budget is going to go to providing services to the rest of the boundaries. We're expanding the footprint. So a, a good portion of that is going to go towards maintenance, towards snow clearing, winters like this, eat up a lot of it. But we will definitely look forward to doing more initiatives, <coughs> more programming for downtown. And the this petition, this very thick document, which actually looks more impressive well, simply because it represents each each uh, each member mm -hmm. what was your response like when you put this out to the existing members about I mean uh, people were very positive they they are looking forward to the savings they feel that they've been they've been providing these services for the last five years on their own at a higher rate so they're looking forward to getting a break um, I had the most interesting conversations actually with the nonprofits who were interested in wondering how our services would be if we were cutting the rates and it was it was a good opportunity to educate people who who don't normally know what we do but overall the feedback was positive people are very happy to pay less <coughs> Council Lubar thank you you just mentioned about increasing programs what type we would do things like more art-based programming with the Northampton Center for the Arts. We would work on getting free public <coughs> Wi-Fi downtown outside. Okay. You know, we'd work with our members also. We want to be able to respond to what our membership is asking for. Thank you. Any other questions of the proponent? Okay. Uh, well, it's from the council, Alan. Well, no, I, I'm on. Um, I'm asking for, for a point of information from you. Sure. And that is, um, <laughs> I'm a plaintiff in both lawsuits. I also am on the committee that's known as No Bid. Uh, I think that I would qualify as being the opposition to the bid's petition. And I'd like to be heard briefly on some of the points. And you, you anticipated the next phase of the hearing, okay. so. If, if, if you'll just allow me, that's why I'm asking if there are other proponents, and then we then we have an opportunity. In fact, you're signed up, but you'll be second. Hope you can live with that. The um, are there any other <coughs> proponents or anyone speaking to the positive in this this request? 
Okay, thank you, Natasha. Um, so now the opportunity for opponents, and on the, I'll go by the sign-up list first, and then um, that doesn't preclude you from speaking. Um, remember, we are speaking about the three tiers of change that are being described, and please keep your remarks relative to that and your expression of opposition to that or, or ambivalence or confusion. That counts, too. So first up, uh, Peter Teitelman, please. You're done? I spoke earlier. Okay, so then the, and <laughs> you will note your remarks for that. Um, okay, Alan, then you are up. I just want to make a few, few comments with regard to uh, statements made on behalf of the bid petition uh, by Natasha. Okay. First of all, I want to make sure that everyone understands that when this vote takes place, this renewal vote takes place, it'll only be members, current members of the bid in good standing who will vote. None of the opt-outs will have any say whatsoever in that vote. I also would like to point out that the state law doesn't have any quorum requirements, which means that if one bid member is the only voter and that bid member votes to renew, the bid is renewed. And um, keep in mind, again, when you consider anything with regard to the bid, that the opt-outs, the non-bid members, represent 61% of all property owners within the Business Improvement District. That means that we, <coughs> the majority, are going to be forced by the minority uh, to become members against our will. Supposed to be on the rate. Uh, excuse me. Excuse me, um, please. No, this is relevant because the rate, we will become subject to the rate, whatever it is, 0.25 or 0.50, if we're forced to become members. So it is relevant with regard to the issue of what the fee will be because right now we don't pay any fees, but if they renew, we will be subject to the fee that you're discussing right now. And um, do you, and and, and I, can I presume that you're speaking opposition of the rate adjustment then? I'm not necessarily speaking okay. opposition to anything except my position is, uh, I'm not in for it either, but my position is that this should be tabled. We, that's another point I'd like to make is that the lawsuit that's scheduled for hearing for trial next month is the state lawsuit. The state lawsuit challenges the adoption of the bid itself. The federal lawsuit just, to st just challenges whether or not the bid should have the power to force non-bid members into membership. So if we're successful in the state lawsuit next month, it means that the bid did not exist ab initio. It was never properly adopted. And therefore, it will not exist anymore unless they bring a new petition. Uh, so uh, I want to, so that answers your question, what would happen if the uh, lawsuit goes forward and we win? It means the bid doesn't exist anymore. And then um, I'd like to um, also point out that, that the petition that you're going to consider isn't just a matter of the rate of membership fee. It also eliminates all residential condominiums and all non, um, all, resi all residential rental properties of less than four units. Now, the language in the bid petition that um, talks about membership is part of the body of the petition. It is not part of the business improvement <coughs> plan part of the petition. Chapter 40, Section 9, is specifically limited to amendments and modifications of the business improvement plan itself. It says nothing, gives you no authority to deal with an amendment to the other parts of the petition. And uh, I'd like you to uh, 
keep that in mind. Uh, I mean, really, we already have two lawsuits. No one wants more lawsuits. I mean, uh, unless anyone has any questions, I have. I have. Yeah, uh, does anyone have any questions to of uh, Mr. Shimas? So, uh, do you I just want to be clear that I was going to ask you: Would you rather we voted yes or no? But your clear statement was: we, What you would like us to do is just table this all. I'd like you to table this until we see what happens with. Uh, at the very least, the state lawsuit, and then, um, and, and if for any reason we uh, are unsuccessful in the state lawsuit, um, we'd want you to um, wait until uh, the federal lawsuit is determined. When was the state lawsuit filed? It was filed one month after your city council. Which was how many years ago? Five years ago. Right. So that one of the things counselors need to know that even though this is coming forward, as you probably know, you know much more about legal stuff than I do, but even though it's coming forward next month, it could still be a long time before we have a legal <laughs> answer to this, right? Well, you could go into that meeting and it could be continued again for well, it's as when you walk in. And of course, it's up to the discretion of the judge as to when he makes his ruling at the trial. But right now, Everything is being fine honed. In other words, um, right right now there's I'm, I'm I'm sorry to use technical terms here, but right now there's a uh, a, a, a a section 16 meeting scheduled with all the lawyers to talk about very specific issues that they want the judge to address. Some of those issues can be addressed by the judge without the requirement of testimony. They, they could just be legal research. Um, so it's possible that some issues uh, can be determined almost much sooner than other issues. And that any one of many of the issues that will be um, decided by the judge without necessary testimony um, are, if okay. we're successful on, on almost any of them, it's fatal to the existence of the bill. So let me just ask you one thing. So supposing we, we don't delay tonight, we either vote yes or no, which is all we're being asked to do right. on, the, on the fee. And supposing we don't delay, what would the harm be in that if a decision then came forward? What is the, the downside is of us doing that? The harm is this. Um, what the bid, what Natasha didn't say, is that this amendment that's being, these amendments, not just the bid fee, but <coughs> eliminating residential condominiums and rental properties, this is a prelude to them holding their renewal vote. They want to make. Excuse the me, but I do understand that. So just to. Okay. So, what I'm saying, so what I'm saying is, what would the harm, I understand, you're saying our preference would be you delay this vote, right. you table it. I'm just asking you, what would the harm be for us to vote either yes or it no? Would, it would, it would. And then the decision comes. I'll be happy to tell you. It will participate, uh, uh, precipitate. Um, it will accelerate the renewal vote process um, because they would never go forward with a renewal vote unless this amendment has been approved by your organization. And um, that's the effect it would have, an acceleration. But then that's different than you're asking us to table the vote. So if, if you knew right now that we were going to vote no on this, would you be supportive of that? I have no opinion. What, one, one way or another, I'm not in favor of the amendment. I, my only position, sir, as I've made quite clear, is that I would like to see it tabled. So I'm a little confused. I just don't understand. I'd like to be uh, clearer sure, about I, the I'm harm not sure it would do. What else I can say it. that will okay. keep you from being Maybe confused? Uh, yeah. Okay. Um, I'll ask that to someone else. Uh, our, and actually, uh, Jordy, you're signed up here. Do you want to speak again? No? You're all set? Jordy, yeah, if you no? can answer my question, I'll. Jordy, you want to answer Paul's question? You're not I'll obliged. I'll try it with you, too, see if you can help me out. Eric, um, you're not Eric. yet, but do you want to answer that question? I, I can try, because Alan was trying to answer it. Um, Come on up and, 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 to, and, to, and, to and once again here. identify. So, so, so my understanding is that. I'm sorry, Eric, can you identify oh, yourself I'm, for the record? Eric, Eric sure. Uh, my understanding is that the amendment 
they are look the bid is looking to exclude all of the residential condominium owners and complexes with less than four units for the very reason that if those folks were able to vote now we're not able to vote chapter 40 the new legislation that was passed last august does not give us a vote so the only people that can vote right now on a renewal vote to make this membership continue to bid the only people that can vote are the existing property owners within the bid, so long as everybody <coughs> understands that. And that makeup is so few when you take the city properties and you take the not-for-profits that the director talked about. The not-for-profits don't pay anything. The city doesn't pay, although the city does pay some in-kind, um, I believe in-kind. Um, there might be some fees that the city pays as a lump sum. I don't recall. I haven't seen the most recent budget, but I do believe in the past there was a lump sum fee. But we are not able to vote but yet we're going to be pulled into this if this is allowed to move forward and if our, if our uh, lawsuit is not successful. So we're asking for you to table for several reasons. One, the lawsuit is being heard within the next month, in the month of April. And to get to your question, I don't think it's going to be months and months before there's a decision made. We've been at this for five years, have spent on both sides and the city included some substantial sums of money. It's a month away. My suggestion would be that the council table this as I think there'll be a much clearer picture for everybody um, one way or the other once that's heard. Clearly, if we lose, I think everybody uh, would then be very happy to see the bid fees cut in half. If we win, then no matter what you would be doing today, there, the city and the bid's going to have a, a fairly substantial problem. So the situation with regard to tonight and and the second vote that you'd have I think um, gets back to what Alan is saying that in terms of tabling this everybody will have a very a much clearer picture um, next month and I don't know if that answers it but I you think did, you actually you, you may not have answered it but you helped you, you were clear and it was helpful but I still don't so my specific question although it was helpful what you said I still don't see I agree with you it'll be clearer when the courts give a decision it'll be clearer I'm just not sure what the harm is I'm I'm not saying whether we're gonna vote yes or no right. three choices we can vote yes we can vote no and we can vote we can take so here, here's I'm not sure what the harm is okay. because the court will make a decision everything will be so clearer. so if you vote in favor of what's in front of you you allow the bid to exclude all of the residential gotcha. condominium owners who would be able to vote now, in the future, what's to say that the bid might decide to charge those residential condo owners? They have the ability to do so. You have the ability to approve it. And so all of those residential condominium owners, if we so chose to go out and market and have those people come forward to help us with a vote, all of those folks potentially would vote no because they would potentially have a fee they'd have to pay. So that's, a, just so I understand, so, I just want to clarify so I'm with you. So therefore, that would be an argument for us to yes. vote no tonight because the fee wouldn't change. Yes. The residential folks would still vote. So I understand that. So a no vote would be something that, okay, we could, that would help us in a way because these residential owners would be able to have a vote. We see this change here of both eliminating them as voters and the cut as just ways of producing more votes for them. Right. So I could understand you're coming and saying, you know, we want you guys to vote no on this. Right. That's pretty and, and there's one more piece to back up what Alan said, and I think you understood that. There is the ability for us to move forward with another lawsuit, which we really don't want to do. We hate the fact that there's two suits now costing everybody money. But the fact is we don't believe that the legislation allows for the bid to adjust who's a member and who isn't a member based on how the petition is now being adjusted. I'm not an attorney. I think Alan spoke about that for a few seconds. The city attorney's not present. But if the council were to get an opinion from city council, I do firmly believe that anybody that understands Chapter 40O and the legislation and how it was drafted and what the bid has the ability to do and not do, <coughs> what you should be voting upon. I think the city also opens itself up in making this vote to another potential issue, just, just which want would make potentially cost the city some more money. Real quick. So that, again, would be a case for you to say to us, guys, you should vote no on this. Vote no or table until the suit I got moves forward. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Um, next up is Jasper Lopiansky. No? Um, Jim Winston, still here? Left. Left. That's it. We have signed up 
for uh, speaking in opposition. Is there okay. anyone else? I, I, want, I, would, I addressed what <coughs> Inspector had asked, but I have you want to speak to separately? Yes. Just up very quickly, yes. because it does it does it does relate to the fee structure. That's that's fine. You know. The director talked about the hotel fee being cut and talked about the business owners, fee, you know, the, the fee being cut to 0 0.0025. So I just want to bring to everyone's attention one point that the existing hotel, one existing hotel within the, the bid district, that the owner of the hotel is no longer part of the board of directors and is no longer a supporter of the bid and does not want to pay a bid fee. I also want to talk to the other two hotels or three or four hotels that are in town, depending upon what you consider or what you, the boundaries. But right outside of the downtown boundaries, there's a new hotel on Con Street. And a little bit further, there's a hotel, the Clarion Hotel, that's uh, a quarter mile away from that. With this fee structure and with the inception of the bid that we've been living with now for five years, the city and the bid has really created a dual structure of business owner. So now one hotel downtown would be required if so passed to have to pay a mandatory bid fee. But yet that same traveler, whether it be a business traveler or a social traveler, that might stay at another hotel down the road is not having to pay that fee. Believe me, that fee is passed on to the customer. It's right on the bill of the Hotel Northampton. You can see it. It's negligible, but it is another fee. More important, as was previously discussed by, I believe, a social worker who came forward, is that you're creating a situation where those of us that have to absorb these fees have to find money somewhere. There's new stormwater management potentially for these fees coming in, the CPA, the increased assessments, which therefore lead to greater taxes. So when you talk about this fee structure, it really is a, a, it's a Trojan horse situation because as much as they're lowering the fees, the more folks that are part of this, their budget's going to increase. You have inflationary factors that need to be considered, so that bid fee is going to keep increasing every year. You also have assessments that are going to increase. As those assessments increase, the bid fees increase. What that comes down to, no matter what this rate is adjusted to, someone has to pay the fee, which means that social worker on the second floor or that restaurant on the ground floor or that hotel or hotel occupant, someone's paying for that. There's only so much those of us can do. My entertainment venues that are downtown have to compete with entertainment venues that might be right outside the district, but yet I'll be required to pay a fee and someone else won't. When you add all this up and you take a look at it, it's created two classes of citizens, of business and, uh, businesses, business citizens, and it's really, it's unfortunate because the majority, when you look at the map of folks downtown, if you exclude all of the city properties and all of the not-for-profits, which add up to millions and millions of dollars, there are very few business owners. In fact, you're looking at the majority in two rows of the folks here who are making up the majority of the bid proponents and the bid own owners of property within the bid district. Excuse me for interrupting, Eric, but again, <coughs> what's more germane here, of course, and this actually speaks to Councilor Spector's point, is we're talking about lowering a bid rate, which, and you're talking more, um, you know, more, you know, you're not, we're not being petitioned to, at this point, no. to you're agree correct. with the existence of the bid, the law that established the bids, right. the the uh, efficacious uh, application of the bids maintenance. We're actually this is this hearing is exclusively devoted to whether we feel it's appropriate uh, to lower the bid rate. And so far, the objection that I've heard is the concern, the Trojan horse yes. argument. Right. And if getting back on point, that's what I should have okay. talked about. Okay. Thank that's you. A, I prefer. Yes. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Anyone else to in speaking in opposition? Yes, sir. Please step up and identify yourself, please. <coughs> Good evening. My name is Steve Ferrarone, and I have four commercial units located on Strong Ave, and they're in a building that's perhaps the newest building where Scandahoovians used to be. And four of those five commercial units, well, all five of them, are basically outside of the redrawn proposed limits of the, the, the present redrawn proposed limits of the bid. But what I'm concerned about, and I just bring this when I hear talk about the, the fee structure, is I'm seeing that before I fell within the bid structure and opted out, that is back in 2009. Now I'm outside the bid structure, the fee is dropping but 
I'm concerned of this, that if at some point or another, because they are able to five years into this change that, there is nothing to prevent them from enlarging the bid, uh, the, the bid perimeter and bringing us back in. And in particular, um, that, that concerns me because even though they're dropping the bid price down now to perhaps make it a more attractive thing for for all of the uh, the commercial people that are either in the bid or that may be in the bid there is no doubt in my mind that that will be a, <coughs> a brief moment in history and will be well beyond and it will grow and grow and continue to grow and th what worries me is uh, is so many of these units right now between 2009 and 2014 the commercial units here are really suffering, and they're suffering primarily, I believe, from the Internet. There is a tremendous amount of, I, I see it in all of my units, people going in, sizing up the retail, deciding that the, what the price is, looking at it, leaving, buying it off the Internet. So what that means is currently <coughs> right now, I, uh, before my <coughs> people even start paying me rent, about $500 goes to taxes and to condo fees for the, for four, the four units I own. If you add an additional amount on the, that they're talking about, I know they're talking about lowering it right now, but I think that it's, it's not easily dismissed. That <coughs> this is part of the, the concern that I've got. For people who are just starting out in business and they're having a difficult time getting going, they're up against between 2009 and 2014, I'm telling you, the internet has ripped retail to <coughs> shreds. If we're talking about adding that, I'm just concerned that it's one more thing that will make it very, very burdensome for small starter people to come into this town and set up and I'll leave it at that. Thank you. So if I could distill your argument, it is you're concerned about the camel's nose under the tent, I'm guessing. Is that is that a fair assessment? Okay. Thank you. Anyone else? <coughs> um, actually I'd uh yes. Come on, identify yourself please. Oh, whoops. You're next. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. Did it's I okay. It's okay. fine. That's great. Um, I just, my name is Mary Beth Bergeron. I'm one of the owners of the Maplewood Shops down the street. Um, I take a little bit of exception with what you said, that the only thing that you're voting on tonight is this de deduction in fees, um, when in fact there are other things that you're voting on contained within this proposal, it, and it, that is who's going to belong to it. Well, it's, it's, that is an appropriate point of conversation, yes. Right. It's the, 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 to discuss the modification of the terms and, and who's the full who scope of to modifications. <coughs> so for me, um, as a person who opted out as one of the owners of the Maplewood shops, uh, not seeing where there would be any advantage for us to be participate in the bid, um, primarily because of our tenant makeup and because of the location of the Maplewood shops. The Maplewood shops has some 60 to 70 lineal feet of frontage on Maple on, on Con Street. That is the only area where the bid might be able to put a few planters. Those few planters with the fee decrease is going to cost the Maplewood shops ownership approximately $11,000 for some planters and for some other things that they do which I understand they participate, you know, you have uh, street cleaning and that kind of thing. Well, down on Cons Avenue, that really is not going to benefit the Maplewood shops. So when we found out that this was being proposed, we contacted Mr. Yakuzo, um, and we had a meeting with him and explained why we had, first of all, opted out, and second of all, why we, <coughs> should, we should be carved out of the bid plan. And frankly, evidently, our property had been under discussion initially when the plan had first been proposed because we really are a fringe property. My property is a fringe property. Mr. Yakuza told us that, unbeknownst to us, and we formally made the proposal that we be opted out and he was to submit it to the board of directors. They subsequently sent us a map where we were carved out. So we have not been actively <coughs> aggressive about uh, challenging our participation in the bid and filing a third lawsuit. 
um, because because we were under the impression that we were going to be carved out. Not only now are we not carved out, but we're going to be paying this this eleven thousand dollars for some planters. And and just to back that up, why we felt we we didn't we needed to opt opt out. We have five nonprofits in our building. We have three hairdressers, one barber, and one retail establishment, an herbal shop. Now, the herbal shop may actually benefit from the bid, marginally so. Not a lot of people are going to walk down the street across the parking lot to the herbal shop because it, unless they really are after some herbs of the cooking variety. Um, it's, it's a destination location. <laughs> Oh. Somebody got it. <laughs> it's a destination location. So I, I guess what I'm saying to you is for me, for my property, for my tenants, to whom I will pass along this fee, I assure you of that, it may take some time, but I will pass it along to them, it is not a <coughs> decrease in the bid fee. It is an $11,000 fee. So you're not really being asked to do just that as a whole here. You're being asked to broadly speaking, approve not only the, the bid and it, it, the inability for people to opt out, uh, but guy, guised under under this proposal. Ex excuse so, me, but I'm you. going to respectfully disagree with that. Okay. That is, that is not what we're charged with and that is not our, we do it, nor is it our authority. Mm -hmm. uh, Councilor Shara, you have a question? When, um, when were you told that you were not going to be carved out and were you given a reason as to why? Uh, we were never told we were not going to be carved out. We were sent a letter. We were, we, we were only given a copy of a map where we were carved out. I'd be glad to give it to you. So, and, and so when did you find out that that wasn't the case? Uh, probably about, I don't know, maybe four or five months ago. Okay, and, and did you ask as to why that, that had changed? Yep, Mr. Yokuzo just, just, just said to me, um, he presented it to the Board of Directors and they just felt we should belong to it. without being given any reason why. There's a kids' clothing store, too, right? Is that a... That's downstairs, which is not included in oh, the... Oh, I see. Okay. The square footage is not uh, included. Got it. Thank you. It's a used clothing store. Any other questions? Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, yes, sir. And, and please, I, I want to reemphasize that... Um, if you could keep your remarks focused on... <coughs> The, decre the proposed decrease in fees and also the uh, reduction of uh, residency requirements, the residential units that would come under this, please. My name is Sean Hebert. I own the Plaza Building on uh, Pleasant Street uh, and Hampton Avenue. I would like to address what you keep saying is, you know, we need to talk only about this vote. I think this vote is a very transparent motivation to to renewal they want to make it look sweeter so this is this really is about the <coughs> renewal vote it's to make it more attractive so the two are very connected and they are they it is a very relevant conversation to talk about the bid in general in this in this forum sir because well, um, I, I honestly think this is all about the renewal this is not about a fee I'm rejection. sorry but the we are required by under laws to conduct the hearing to the petition and what the intent and any other aspect of this can be can be vetted out in public and as they make their case uh, they may not succeed or they may succeed and that has absolutely no bearing on whether we've on our vote tonight and has no bearing on the hearing and that is why I ask because because we could be here until we all die of old age if we open it up for the broader philosophical discussion of the bid which has been had and continues to be had in this community, in the state, without, throughout the country. I'm not discounting your comments or remarks, and I'm not even representing that I disagree with you. What I'm asking, though, please, for the purpose of this hearing, that we keep our remarks limited to that. So far, I've been fairly lenient on that count, and we have heard from any number of people why they don't like the bid or like the concept of the bid or the possibility of being part of the bid. That's nowhere here in this petition. Right, um, and, and so my I only argument is is that the motivation behind this amendment is very relevant to well, your vote tonight, I, sir. I no, really believe noted, that. and I and I appreciate your comments to that effect. And I think I think I think you can be confident that council is pretty aware 
that this is not just an arbitrary decision to start to cut rates and just hope things go well. And in fact, it was even represented by the proponents that this would make this more palatable given the circumstance of mandatory uh, enrollment. So to, if, if, unless you have any comments relative to the things that we're discussing under the hearing, <coughs> I, you know, if you have an objection to the reduction of, of the requirements for uh, residential units and a, an objection to um, the reduced fees, Beyond, and I acknowledge your objection is that, again, it's the camel's nose under the tent or it's a Trojan horse argument that, that Eric presented. <coughs> is there anything more than that? No. No. Thank you, Sean. I appreciate that. Um, anyone else? I, I think uh, if Attorney Doherty would step up, please, and I think to address principally the concern that was expressed or the the question that was raised about our ability to proceed with two pending suits. Does that have any relevance or bearing on, in your opinion, I understand that you're not our attorney, but I would I think your interest would be helpful. Thank, thank you. My name is Hamilton Doherty. I live at 48 College View Heights, South Hadley. I'm an attorney for the Northampton bid. Uh, on, on your question, this is, although it certainly is tied into a lot of other factors that are related to it, the decision for you, and as you've described it correctly, is, is, is a yes or no decision, is really independent of either a subsequent renewal vote or the outcome of any of the litigation. It will, if, you, if this petition is accepted, it will be effective on July 1, and it will go forward with the bid in whatever stage or whatever <coughs> other circumstances uh, are, are in place on, on July 1. <clears throat> there is a hearing date that is scheduled for the, uh, the state uh, court case uh, next month. It is not the first trial date. It is a trial before a judge. So uh, uh, not only the scheduling, but in terms of a, an ultimate decision, the timing is unpredictable, uh, as are uh, the efforts of an, of an appeal by uh, either party dissatisfied with the judge's decision. Uh, so there is no... There is no uh, Finality that's going to come out of uh, out of that trial. Same is true of the, the federal case, which is slight different issues, much much different issues. Uh, it is a much newer case. Uh, it does not have a trial <coughs> date, uh, but is not going to get resolved in the, in the near future. And in your opinion, or are you <coughs> representing that the process by which the uh, the bid is petitioned, and even the strategy, if if we can call it that, it, that's is that in, against the law, or is it conforming to the laws as, as, the, as it's laid out? On I, I, I think it's conforming to the law. The, uh, and, and thank you for asking that question. That touches on two points that I was going to make. Uh, the, <clears throat> the fee schedule that is before you tonight appears both in the petition by statute, by requirements from the statute, re appears both in the petition and in an improvement plan, which is, is a bid phrase for a business plan or a, a strategic <coughs> plan. The statute requires it to, be, to appear in both. Uh, and in, in addition, the boundaries of the district are appeared in the original petition. So the, the boundaries of the district were established with your vote in, in uh, 2009, and they're not going to get changed except by another vote of the city council going through an amendment process just like what we're going through now. There has been no amendment of those uh, districts. There is in the petition, there is a kind of a meets and bounds uh, property description of what is in the district, uh, and there is a map. Uh, and there may be it's questions about certain properties at certain locations. Uh, but the definitions are, uh, were established in, uh, in 2009 haven't been changed. <coughs> the, uh, there is an amendment process in the statute. The reference was, was to Section 9. and. Be, given the information that is both in the petition and in the plan, it really doesn't make any sense to say, well, the statute allows you to uh, amend the plan but doesn't allow you to amend the petition. Uh, that, that doesn't make any sense. So I think the statute has to be read that, that uh, the council which approved the original petition, the original plan, has the authority to amend both of those. And that's the reason that both, both the documents, the petition and the plan, were mentioned in the amendment petition. That, and that speaks to uh, Mr. Scheinman's <coughs> suggested that the, the authority to uh, modify the residential units 
uh, does not come under the purview of uh, 40 uh, 9 I, I'm not sure exactly that that's what is it you know what you're saying but on, on, on that point I, if I may I read from the, the original on the residential condominiums to which there's been reference here the original petition that was passed <coughs> in 2009 said in the in the paragraph three the same one that you you par you paraphrased or referenced it, uh, talking about the properties in the bid district it says all private and public properties shall be included within the district with the exception of residential condominiums and single-family residences and then it goes on with the fee schedule well, sing residential condominiums have been excluded from the bid from day one they've never been subject to a fee and that's not changed in this amendment the, the original language does say single-family residence. That, in fact, was, was uh, different from what ended up in both the Articles of Organization of the Bid District and in the, in the uh, fee plan that was developed, where there are no fees charged for re residential units of three, or excuse me, residential properties of three or fewer units. That, has, that is a, as I understand it, has always been the practice of the bid it is not what it says in the petition, and it's not what it says in the plan. So the, the amendment, as long as we were going to be here as an amendment anyway, there was an intention to <clears throat> make the, the petition and the, and the plan consistent with what had been the billing practice. And that's why in the amendment, it, the, the exception to speci specifically uh, residential condominiums and exclusively residential buildings with less than four units. <coughs> Both the residential condominiums have never been uh, included, never been billed, never had uh, voting rights. Had bid members would not vote in a uh, in a renewal vote, uh, and it, <coughs> as it had been applied, uh, residential owners of residential properties of three or few units have not been billed and have not had a, uh, a vote in the uh, in in the bid or would not have a vote in the renewal. Uh, are there any questions of the of attorney Doherty? Uh, Alan or Eric, you want to refute or challenge that? Absolutely. Uh, I take uh, issue with my brother attorney here. Um, if he's completely mistaken about the membership of the residential uh, properties in the bid, if he's correct, then all of the assents that were signed by residential condominium unit owners in support of the petition should be thrown out because they are not members of the bid. And, and it's, it's incredible to, th that he would make a statement like that when the vast <coughs> majority of the assents to the original bid petition, the vast majority, were from residential unit owners. That's the first thing. The second thing is I'd like to point out to, to the council that a simple look at Section 9 of Chapter 40 O. Section 9 is the section that they're citing as authority for what they're asking you to do. If you just look at it, you will see that it relates solely to the amendment of business improvement plans. It says nothing about giving you the authority to amend the original petition. Read it. Just look at it. Get a legal opinion. That's all I have to say about it. Thank you. Uh, uh, Alan? Get your folder. Uh, Attorney Doherty, you have the opportunity to respond. Could I respond on just please. one issue, please? And, and that is the suggestion that, that there were residential owners, single family uh, owners who signed the petition that's in front of you today. And that's not the case. Uh, and confirmed with the assessors through the city clerk's office, the petition that is before you today is signed by uh, <coughs> voting members of the bid. And it does not include single fam uh, owners of single family residents. What may, the confusion may be <laughs> is in a different process in the first petition establishing the bid under a different section of the statute and a different set of requirements of the number of owners and which owners signed a petition to start the bid residential owners would qualify 
for voters on that initial pet petition. Uh, and there were some. I don't know what the number is. There were some, but they, they had the right to, to, uh, uh, to vote at that time for the first petition. <clears throat> but on this amendment petition, there are no single family uh, owners. They may own single family properties, but it, it's not as owners of single uh, family properties that they signed the bid, the petition. Thank you for that distinction. Um, well, okay, Jordy or Eric wants to, you want to respond to that one point? Say one word, that's cynical. Um, you were saying that's cynical? Yes. Okay. Eric, is that what you wanted to say too? No. Okay. But along the same lines. <laughs> we wouldn't be here today. Come, come to the microphone, we, we please. Wouldn't, we wouldn't be here today. There wouldn't be two suits that have cost the city and the bid and, and those of us that have funded the, the suits the money if council that came in front of the city council, council for the bid, council for the city, had done their job properly. And to hear the bids council now state that the, that the residential condominium owners had always been excluded is, is insane to me. I'd love to take the tape of this meeting and put it in front of the judge when we have our, our case in front of the judge. They used those assents, they used and counted those votes of the residential condominium owners as non-fee paying members, but those votes were counted. We've got the count. We can bring the count forward with the total amount of folks who, who signed those assents in favor of the bid. So all along there have been these issues with how the bid has conducted themselves. And if you're listening to this <coughs> attorney now stating that that was incorrect, then uh, the council's getting bad judgment. And I, as Alan had mentioned, I would highly suggest that you seek Council to answer those questions and not the bid council because he's very incorrect. They can't have their cake and eat it too. They can't use those votes when they need them and then say, we don't want them now. When those same residential condominium owners, if faced with a vote and a renewal vote, understanding that they might in fact down the road be fee paying members, would vote no. So they want them out. And that's what you're voting on tonight. Well, you. Uh, this is a uh, Trojan horse regardless of what they're telling you. So you, uh, yes. and, and I noted that you, you, that's um, Principally take issue with the strategy. Yes. Got it. Uh, Claudio. <laughs> um, my name is Claudio Guerra, and I am on the board of directors of the bid, and I also own property in downtown. And just want to quickly say, and I'm going to just address the, the fee here uh, very quickly, but uh, I'm really proud of the bid and, and everything that it's done. And I don't see a plan B, you know, uh, the, the indentured uh, slaves of, uh, of the, uh, the, what was it called again? The, uh, the honor court, they're not, they're not coming back. And, and so I've done my part, but then this is where we're going to the fee. I am, however, uh, tapped, and I, I don't want to pay the point oh five anymore. Uh, and I don't care how long, I mean, I do care. I hope this thing gets resolved quickly because everybody's getting sick of this, I'm sure. But I want to pay, uh, ha I would like to pay less. And I am, as a property owner here, I'm, uh, I, I just, it's a burden for, for, uh, to, be, to carry the rest of the town, and I'm tired of it, and I want to go to point oh oh two five, and I think it's a fair rate, and I hope you guys decide to pull the trigger on that. Thank you. Councilor Specter? You? Well, I'm not sure who would ask this question to, and it may be a follow-up well, we counselor. I mean, the other opportunity, if you have no more questions, we can close the hearing. And we can, and we can and recognize somebody. Yes. If yes. Yeah, and then we can choose to recognize. Yes, sir. My name is Alan Hankowski. I have a property on Crabs Avenue, and I hear a lot of things. Claudio just stating that uh, the non-fee members uh, are getting something for nothing, and by statute that's excluded. You, the the opt-outs are not supposed to get anything under the law, and if he's benefiting because he's got retail establishments, that's fine. That's in opposition to. Uh, let's say the psychologists on the sec floor, second floor who aren't getting anything. But just listening to this and listening to the attorney and knowing a little bit about it in history, uh, I think it's terribly, what you're looking at tonight is terribly confused. It may be time to really get an opinion before you go vote on something that you shouldn't have and now you do have another lawsuit. Thank you very much. Anything else from, uh, in, in public hearing? 
If not, I'm going to ask. Uh, Move to close the public hearing. Second. Motion made and seconded to close public hearing. All those in favor? Please Aye. Aye. Opposed? <coughs> Any abstentions? Public hearing is closed. Um, we do have on our agenda later the discussion and the vote on this. If and actually, we're not obliged to actually vote on it now either. Just and I'd ask the council preference, and if there is a preference, with the bulk of the audience here tonight, well, it's say two thirds <coughs> by the looks of it, um, are interested in the outcome of that vote if we have it. So we can move it up in the agenda if you want. I don't know what, what's the council. I request we move it up in the agenda to. I second that. Okay. Is it your preference to move with a vote and discussion and deliberation? Or would you like to defer that to the next meeting? I, I mean, I, I would move the motion as uh, presented to us tonight onto the floor. Okay. Motion's been made to accept the petition, although uh, in, is there a second? On I'll that? second for the sake of discussion. Okay, for the purposes of discussion, and we'll start. Council Labarge, did you want to start? No? Oh. You had your hand Let's up. Let's let somebody know. else speak first, and then I'll speak. Oh, okay. Uh, well, Councilor Karn. Um, again, as you pointed out, uh, Councilor Dwight, this is, um, as is usual, we take two votes on any issue. So um, there is obviously a two-week period between now and our second vote. Uh, should this even pass uh, when, when the votes are cast. So um, I'm comfortable with having an additional two weeks with also the request that we, uh, <clears throat> you know, ask for the, uh, city's, the city's attorney on this matter to uh, the, weigh uh, in. It wouldn't be the city solicitor we're going to have. We have a separate attorney for this. Right, I understand yeah. it's Fitzgibbons, right? Yeah. Yes, so. Uh, um, attorney Fitzgibbons would. If, or even a memo that would address the. Attorney Fitzgibbons reviewed this petition before it came to the city council and has been working with um, the petitioners and with the city clerk and with the assessors and has been uh, monitoring this process. So. That has been reviewed, but if you would like something more formal, I'm on comfortable the questions, taking. I'm comfortable yeah. taking a vote tonight, mm -hmm. and then also uh, I, I am sensing that it would be useful to other councilors to either have issues addressed sure. uh, via a memo or to have Attorney Fitzgibbons present. At Certainly, the I, mean, I think there are, there are specific questions that, of course, are brought up tonight, mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. um, and that need clarification. Um, I, I think. Uh, more less specific to the rate change okay. mm -hmm. um, and also I, 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 I do not understand despite the arguments made how we would be constrained because they're pending suits that doesn't seem to I, I don't understand how that could possibly be because we are we are abiding by existing law I believe the term Trojan horse has multiple applications this well, it swings both that's my <laughs> yes, exactly so um, I'll, I'll, I'll yeah, Continue since you, you can finish and then it's okay. Okay. Um, uh, First of all, I want to thank everybody who um, came up and gave us their, uh, their two cents on this matter. I know it's very complex and, um, and that there's a lot at stake here. Um, in, this, in this particular matter, um, the lowering of the fees and um, the, amended, the amended structure, I, I am comfortable uh, supporting that this evening. I am uh, very much in support of the bid and uh, I, I uh, appreciate all of the value that that brings to our downtown in terms of the services and the, um, the immense amount of work that has gone into the, the creation of the bid and the, um, the events and the commitment and the dedication to improving the downtown. <coughs> At the same time, I have my own issues with some you know, language that's in there and some of the goals that, you know, may may conflict with my, um, some of the uh, the focus on uh, seeking ordinances, uh, uh, anti-solicitation ordinances and things like that that we've had in the past. That's been my bailiwick. However, um, I'm very comfortable with supporting this tonight and um, I would ask colleagues to support it as well. Councilor Speck. Yeah. <coughs> Councilor, I think you pointed out what I was going to say, but I, I do think it's worth repeating of what we're voting on. And we're not voting on whether 
the bid's a good or bad thing, whether the services it provides are valuable, the right services, and we're not even voting on whether the, uh, this should be mandatory or not. And as one person who I did say at that meeting and supported the bid initially and used the argument that it was voluntary, and I find the state's action making it mandatory something that feels imp it, it, they're imposing this on, on the city. But it's not something that the bid asks, it's not something that the councilors asked for. Our vote here is we have three choices. We can table this. We can vote yes or we can vote no, and we should look at what each of those choices are. I don't see by tabling this, again, I didn't get an answer to what the harm would be if we table it. Yes, there could be a decision by the court in a month. I, anyone want to bet me that that doesn't come about in a month, I'll take a bet and I'll give good odds on that, that this decision will not come down, or if it does come down in the next six months, that somebody won't appeal that decision. So it's taken five years till now. We could be looking at another couple of years of the decision, and let's be straight and honest about that. So, and, and even if the decision and the outside chance it did come down in the next couple of months, well, then it would, if it came down on the side that the bid, there were illegal parts of it, then you know what? That would clarify a lot here, and maybe the whole bid would then dissolve. If we vote no on this tonight, then it means that the old fee structure stays in place. And I'm hearing that what they would like to do, regardless of what kind of motives we attach to what a vote would look like, that would be the way that if that vote were to then come through and folks say, yeah, we're going to continue the bid, well, then the fee structure would be at that higher rate. And so I'm going to support the lower, because we don't have other choices. That's not what we're voting on here. I wish we were voting on the state's, the state legislature's ruling. I think I wish we had jurisdiction over them, but we don't. What we're voting on is whether or not we support this particular uh, petition to lower the rate, and I'm going to support it. Anyone else? Other comments? Councilor O'Donnell? I think it might feel good to cut a rate in half, so I, um, I support that. I think if we take no action, then the time will come, and um, there will be more businesses in the bid, and they'll be paying the high rate that they do today. So I support reducing the fee. To me, it's pretty, pretty simple. Council LaBarge? Yes. Um, I'm very pleased to hear that at least we'll have, I think it was attorney, what was his name? Fitzgibbons, and getting some legal opinion from him because um, I am having some problems about some of the language that I have heard tonight about the two lawsuits. I think the bid has done an excellent job in the city, an excellent job. Would I want to pay what they're paying right now? No. If I was a property owner, commercial or whatever here, down in the district area and going through the recession that we did go through, you did survive, you did make it, and thank you for being who you are. But I feel we are strictly talking about this fee structure. I will support it tonight. This is the first vote. Hopefully I will get more calls, but I think once we hear from Attorney Fitzgibbons, it's probably gonna make me feel a little bit better about the direction I'm gonna go in my next vote. That is very critical for me, so I will support this tonight. Anyone else? Um, I, I'd <coughs> like to acknowledge, first of all, the concerns that were expressed, um, even though it isn't necessarily, as I pointed out, necessarily germane to the discussion on the fee issue, but I don't think it's fair to ignore them. And. All the pressures that the downtown businesses are feeling. Uh, and by the way, I'm a victim. You're looking at an unemployed city councilor whose job went the way of the internet. Gobble it up, change it, my business doesn't exist anymore. What you also heard tonight were discussions about a stormwater fee and whether it applies to the people who live out in Linseed Avenue and Hatfield and don't benefit from any services. You, in fact, actually every discussion tonight, I'm talking about, even about Forest Street, all actually, we're talking about a system, and a system 
comprised of individuals working together to create and promote a better system. Not individual islands of, of enterprises and not individual human beings who, who were just <coughs> fortunate to live next door to. This, the, the bid, I, you know, I've, I've spoken with people about this. I'm, I was an agnostic about the bid. I think it's a, I think any number of state mechanisms to get around the fact that they're supposed to be charging progressive tax based on ability to pay, but no, in their clever way, we have a lottery, we've got casinos, we've got medical marijuana, we've got, we've got the, uh, we have enterprise funds, we have all sorts of gee whiz, gosh bang devices in which to circumvent an honest collection of revenue for the greater good. Okay. <coughs> That's where I sit on that. And as Councilor Spector said, I, I don't get to do a damn thing about that. I don't have the authority. Maybe you're all breathing a sigh of relief in that respect. But the fact is, is that, <laughs> yes, these may be silly devices. And yes, they actually, they're, they're intrinsically unfair. There's a whole lot of things that we discussed that actually ultimately do not necessarily subscribe to the ethos of fairness. But the fact is, is what the objective is, and this is what I would hope people would start to concentrate on, even regardless of where you sit on this, but that this is about us. When you say the city this, the city that, we're talking about us, all of us, who contribute to <coughs> the welfare of the community and its survivability. That's my come to Jesus talk. That's it for that. But the, as, as to this particular issue, um, it really, if, if, this, if you subscribe to the fact that this is part of a strategy, and I'm not naive enough to think that it isn't, I think it absolutely. I think if I'm in the bid and I'm on the bid board right now and suddenly I'm faced <coughs> with, and the, I don't think they're excited about this prospect, faced with the prospect of suddenly a collection of people who are required to be in there and consequently probably not really keen on it, that you want to soften the blow. If that strategy works, good on them. If it doesn't, too bad. I don't vote on their strategy. We're not voting on their strategy. We're not voting on the efficacy of the bid or the ethics of the bid. We're not voting on any of those things. We have a petitioner before us who's legally incorporated, at least until such time that if uh, the suits determine otherwise, <coughs> but currently as we understand them, they're legally incorporated and abiding by all the edicts laid out by the state. And they're asking us to reduce fees to their membership. And I can't make a cogent argument to say, no, you can't reduce fees. That's stupid. I don't think I'd hear any, I don't, I mean, so far the only objection I heard was that it's, it's a bad strategy. It's a clever ruse. And that may or may not be true, and I wouldn't even argue that point one way or the other. But I actually respect every person who spoke tonight, including the proponents and opponents. And I think their objectives are motivated by any number of things. None of them suspect. All of them valid. So now the charge that I have, and I would agree with this, I think it is an appropriate vote to reduce the rates. What I, the only question I have, and I want to, I do want clarification on, is what Mr. Sh Attorney Scheinman had mentioned about <clears throat> the authority to uh, to make the adjustment for residential units. Um, that does need some clarification, and I hope to have that by the time we have the second vote. Um, and to that end, it is also my intent to vote in the affirmative for this for this petition. And with that windy, gusty amount of stuff, uh, is there anyone else who would like to speak on the council? And I'll ask the clerk to call the roll, please. Councilor Yes. 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 The vote passes in first reading and will be reconsidered in the next council meeting in April. Request for recess? Uh, there's been a request for recess. Uh, we are recessing for seven minutes, please.
Thank you. Uh, hello, we're back from uh, the recess uh, or the Northampton City Council meeting. This is uh, March 20th, 2014. Uh, I'm Councillor Bill Dwight. I'm the uh, Council President presiding sometimes. Um, next up, we have a presentation of the forestry plan for the Northampton water supply area. Mm -hmm. um, I would ask the, con well, actually, it's part of the presentation, so we don't need to recognize some, uh, Jim, who do you have with you? You have five people? <laughs> I got more outside. <laughs> well, in the, in the interest, I, 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 have I, I want a, a good presentation of this, but of course I'm also concerned about the time as well, and sure. I just want to note that this is for informational purposes for the council. The, uh, clearly you understand we've all uh, experienced um, some outreach by um, uh, some residents and, and one in particular about the concern about the forest management plan and ha how it's being executed in the in the water protection areas and the reason we requested this uh, meeting was informational for the councilors to understand as they go forward there is no vote associated with this important fact I should mention that the council really doesn't have an authority here we don't we don't authorize the plan we don't approve it. we do have influence we do not have authority, and I think the distinction is rather important to note. But we are also the point of contact for the community, and as such, we're asking for this informational meeting. With that, then after being all blowhardy like that, I'm going to ask you to be succinct. <laughs> so, so. <laughs> okay, you started by asking. I'm Jim Laurel, the city engineer. I work in the Public Works Department of uh, City of Northampton. Um, I'll be providing the presentation tonight. You have uh, handouts that were circulated uh, a little bit earlier. Um, I had planned on doing the presentation entirely myself. We have other people here, depending on questions that happen uh, or come up. I have um, Nicole Sanford, who helped uh, prepare the presentation, is here this evening, as well as Mike Mori, uh, the city's uh, forester, our consulting forester, is with us. And of course, um, Ned Huntley, the director of public works, is here as well. So if um, things and, come up. And you want to just note that Doug's here too. Doug McDonald's just, no, he just, you know, he, he doesn't, Doug, he's not here. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to. Doug McDonald's here. <laughs> he's he's interested as a resident about the forestry, but he's more interested in the stormwater utilities. Right, right. So he'll have a long evening. Like him later. Okay. So um, can I start? Please. Great. So um, thanks very much for asking us to come uh, this evening to talk about the forestry program. Um, it's actually a program that we're quite proud of, um, so I'm, I'm happy to be here and describe uh, to you that some of the things that we're doing in the watershed. Um, I wanted to thank the councilors that took the time this weekend to take a walk around in the woods with uh, Mike Mori and myself. I think that was um, clearly educational. I think it's, uh, it's great that, that you came out to take a look at what we're doing. Um, so I guess, Mary, I'm going to kind of move along here. So the um, presentation this, overview. What's it, could we lose this row of lights, or, or yeah. does it? Thanks. Maybe I think it's split down the middle. Let's see. No. Well, even this set, yeah, that's that's perfect. That's great. Good. So, uh, presentation overview. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about <coughs> the water supply reservoirs and the watersheds in terms of where they are. Um, some of the listening audience may not know exactly the areas that we're we're talking about and walking. I'm just going to talk a little bit about watershed protection, which is sort of the umbrella that the forestry program falls under. And then we'll have time for questions if folks have questions, uh, if the councils have questions when we get to the end. Okay. So this map, which is probably a little bit hard to see, shows the water supply locations. The city has three main drinking water supply reservoirs. So in the upper part of the slide is the Ryan Reservoir and the West Waitley Reservoir. Um, and then just a little bit uh, down from there is the uh, Mountain Street Reservoir. Um, the reservoirs actually, they're not located in Northampton, they're located in Williamsburg, uh, Whateley and Conway, and uh, some in Hatfield. So that just gives you a little bit of orientation. Um, some people uh, still think that the Roberts Meadow reservoirs that we have by Musanti Beach are the city's public water supply, and that hasn't been the case for quite a while. Um, next slide, please. So um, Mountain Street Reservoir, just to, to give a sense of the, the size, the the reservoir is shown there in blue. The black line uh, surrounding that shows the limits of the watershed. Um, <coughs> the watershed for Mountain Street Reservoir is about 531 acres. Of that total amount of land, um, the city owns 321 acres of the watershed. So a pr pretty good percentage of the watershed there is, is protected. 
Um, the city's largest reservoir is the Ryan and West Waitley complex. Uh, this slide shows the two reservoirs. Ryan is a much larger reservoir and the watershed in turn is much larger. Um, the city owns about uh, 1,667 acres um, surrounding these two reservoirs in this, in this area. Um, a, a slide just to give you a sense of land ownership within the watersheds. Um, sort of the, the lighter green color shows the property that's owned by the city of Northampton. And the darker green is uh, land that's owned by the state Department of Conservation and Recreation. That's the Conway State Forest, sort of the upper left part of that slide. So it gives you a sense of uh, the ownership, the amount of property within the watershed that the city owns. Um, the key elements of watershed management and the things that we practice um, at, in public works uh, routinely here for the city um, basically is set under a watershed resource protection plan. It's a document that's required by the State Department of Environmental Protection um, and it outlines a lot of different things that we do um, to protect the city's water. Two of the main things uh, are a land acquisition program and the forestry program. <coughs> land acquisition is something that um, is very obviously very protective. If you can remove land from development and, and control that property, then that is probably the most protective way of, of protecting the watershed for the city. Um, we actively send out um, letters to folks that own land within the watershed and express an interest in purchase if they're, if they're ever interested in selling. And of course, the forestry program I'll be talking about more tonight. And I think um, the last bullet here is that this is really a long-term plan. It's a plan that, that, that gets laid out in decades to protect the city's water supply. And I, I always remember uh, Jim Dostal, who was the, on the Board of Public Works for a long time. And one of the things that Jim always used to tell us is that we do a lot of things day to day. We get a call to, to fill a pothole, we get a call to trim a, a city tree. These are things that come and we take care of them and they're done. When you think about water supply, Jim says you should always remember, it was at the turn of the century that the Board of Water Commissioners in the city of Northampton had the forward thinking enough to establish a system that would provide the water that the city relies on today. And it's a very good system and we have plenty of water. And Jim says you should always remember that in the activities that you do for the city. This is really one of those key areas in terms of forestry management and land acquisition where we're focused on the long term. There's a lot of things the city will see the benefit when you know, it may be decades from now. We may not be around when we see some of the benefits of the planning that we're doing now, but um, it's really a long-term vision, and I'll be talking about that a little bit when we get into the forestry part. <coughs> so I mentioned the, water the Watershed Resource Protection Plan. Um, that was originally drafted in 1994. Um, the plan was required by the state um, because at that time the city had a filtration, water filtration waiver, uh, basically from the, from the regulatory authorities. There's a uh, a law that requires that surface water reservoirs like the city has, they have to be filtered. And we had a waiver from that requirement, and a key component of that waiver is to make sure that the raw water going into your reservoir was clean and safe. Um, the Quabbin Reservoir to this day still has a filtration waiver. They have a watershed resource protection plan and forestry programs that allow them to maintain the waiver. We updated the plan most recently in, in 2011. Um, the plan identifies a lot of natural characteristics and land use activities and threats to the water quality within the watershed. And then it lays out um, actions that we can take to minimize uh, potential adverse impact to the water quality. And as I mentioned, um, ongoing land acquisition and forestry elements are pretty key part of that plan. And uh, ultimately the maintenance of the fact that we maintain the plan, we do get credit from DEP in terms of a water treatment credit because the they view uh, the plan as uh, resulting in cleaner water entering the reservoir and a slight reduction in the amount of disinfection that needs to happen as a result of that. So uh, a quick update on land acquisition. Um, I think as most of the councilors are aware, um, Public Works in the city have been very active um, in the last few years in purchasing property. Um, since 2009, about 171 and a half acres have been purchased. Um, we've got about another eight, 80 acres of property. We're, we're talking to uh, property owners right now about purchasing land. Um, and ownership of property in undeveloped forested state is really the most protective for water. So a key component of what we do is trying to buy the land and protect it from development. This, uh, this uh, slide here just it shows um, 
Again, this is a little bit hard to read. It just basically shows there are a number of parcels that we're looking at either, <coughs> either we've purchased them recently or other uh, parcels that we're having ongoing discussions with owners about. But the other important part of this slide I wanted to say was that it's an ongoing program and the funding for land acquisition um, usually comes from three potential sources of money, the Water Enterprise <coughs> Fund, uh, the Timber Revenue Account, and state grants. Um, the Timber Revenue Account was really uh, the main way that the city used to buy land in the watershed a uh, decade or two decades ago based on timber revenues from, <coughs> from forestry work in the watershed. That money went into a, a specific account and then the Board of Public Works would use that account to purchase land. Um, now we've bought a lot of land in, in the last few years as I just indicated. The timber revenue account balance I think is zero at this point um, and we'll be building that back up and I'll, I'll talk about the finances a little bit later in these slides but these are the sources of funds that we typically rely on. We've been pretty successful in getting state grant money, I think, as, as the counselors uh, are aware. So we hired uh, a team of, uh, of scientists and foresters to help put together the, the forest stewardship plans for us. The goal right from the plan, which I'll read, is promote and sustain a diverse, healthy, and vigorous forest and maintain associated infrastructure in good operating condition so that the primary goal of water quality protection and secondary goals of long-term timber revenue and habitat diversity are, are served. So that's sort of the overarching um, goal that we use in all the decisions that we make uh, as part of the forestry program. So a little overview of the, of the forestry program. Um, the city actually has a long history of, uh, of working in the watershed and uh, I think uh, it goes way back. If you look in the forest stewardship plan, the city used to cut trees down in the watershed to, to, to heat the water department with wood, which I think goes back to sort of the mid early 20th century. Um, but more recently in the 80s <coughs> through the 90s, we had a forester that worked closely with the public works department. Uh, logging was active at that time. Revenues from the work uh, that was done was put into the timber revenue account, as I had mentioned. Um, the uh, forestry management program was dormant for over a decade. Um, with some transitions within the department and the, uh, the fact that the forester that the city was working with had passed away. So there was a transitional period there where nothing really happened uh, in the watershed in terms of forestry. Um, we picked that up really around in 2011 with a request for proposals where we had um, solicited uh, licensed forester, foresters and, and, um, and scientists to help us develop these new plans. Uh, part of the plans uh, include the history inventory and assessment of the current forest. They outline, they outline uh, city goals and steps, implementation steps that can be taken to help achieve those goals. We made, the, uh, we made the decision at that time when the stewardship plans were put together to also add um, sort of a green certification process level which involves um, additional input and oversight from the Department of Conservation and Recreation so that wood products that come out of the the work that we do are, are certified as being uh, green and sustainable. The forest stewardship plans were ultimately approved by the state DCR. Um, the plans cost uh, about $35,000 and change. Um, there was a DCR grant that provided about $21,000 that went toward the cost of preparation of those plans. So that gives you a little bit of an overview of how we get up to where we are today. In the stewardship plans, there's a section that describes uh, the watershed forest in terms of an ideal condition. Um, and the condition that we're aiming for here in the long run is a diverse forest of vigorous site-adapted native trees and shrubs. Um, we're looking for trees to be able to grow to a mature size. Uh, and we're also looking for a variety of forest regeneration with uh, desirable new trees. So uh, different types of trees, and I'll, I'll, I'll be talking about this in a minute. <coughs> and we're looking for um, more of a multi-aged forest than we have now. The, uh, the land that we own uh, used to be mainly in farming at the turn of the century. And the reforestation of all those old farms in that area all happened around the same time. So what happened, when, when you walk around out there, you'll see that the age of the trees pretty much are fairly uniform. And that's something that we're looking to, um, to change to allow some of those trees to grow uh, to old, mature, um, beautiful heights and to also have more <coughs> younger trees in the understory. So that's a, a key component of what we're trying to accomplish. And then these, uh, these conditions of, the, of sort of the ideal forest 
are essential characteristics of a sustainable forest filter for water supply. And forest filter is sort of a term that's used in the water supply industry to, um, to reflect the fact that high water quality results from a forest that's well managed. Uh, I wanted to talk a little bit about the forest in transition. Um, there, was some, uh, there was some quotes in the paper about forest health, and I think those were a little confusing because we're not actually saying that the forest is not healthy and we're trying to make the forest healthier. But what we want to point out is that the forest is in, in transition, and um, it's really interesting to learn more about this. I didn't know a lot about this when we, when we started this work. And having the foresters and scientists that we're working with uh, provide a lot of information really allows you to understand um, in a lot more detail the things that are happening in the forest that the casual, the casual observer wouldn't notice. Um, and there's a few of them I've got listed here. Uh, there's, there's a general decline of hemlock trees um, related to uh, elongate hemlock scale, which we have a fair amount of in the watershed, and also the woolly adelgid, which we have some, but I think the scale is more of a problem from what I understand at this point. Um, there's a decline in red pine plantations that were planted by the city decades ago, uh, mainly because of a variety of diseases and pests, and we'll talk about that in a minute. There's also a decline in white ash and beech tree. We have significant interfering uh, vegetation factors. We have, we have a lot of uh, oriental bittersweet in some areas, not all areas of the uh, watershed, but in some areas we have uh, bittersweet that's quite problematic. And we also have... Uh, some old grapevines as well, uh, which also are interfering with the growth <coughs> of some of the trees out there. Um, I just mentioned that the, the forest in general is, is about, it, it's around the same age, so what, what's happened is we have a, a very closed canopy within the, uh, within the forest, and I'll, I'll talk about that a little bit. And then lastly, I just wanted to mention that uh, really at any point, because of different types of weather conditions, you can have uh, environmental disturbance, whether it's a uh, hurricane or, or tornado or um, ice storm, snowstorm in October, whatever the condition can be, um, there are other things that can really uh, have an impact on what the forest, uh, what the forest looks like. So I've got a few slides here that uh, will show you some pictures of uh, the things that I was just talking about in terms of the forest and transition. Um, this first uh, photo shows wind shear that happened and, and cut off the top of these hemlock trees in a, a, a summer microburst back in the summer of 2011. Um, and forests can be, can be impacted by severe weather, as I had just mentioned. Um, this photo shows um, really a, sort of a barren area under, uh, under a group of hemlocks, so a hemlock understory, um, with all the trees starting with the same general uh, time frame in terms of growth. Um, the, f the forest lacks a lot of uh, <coughs> sort of variety of features and configurations um, and some of the, uh, we just don't, there's obviously not a lot of or any young trees growing up under this hemlock understory. So that's something that through the, the logging that we're doing and some of the silvicultural activities that we're doing, we're looking to open up areas like this to allow sunlight to come in and other types of trees um, to move in and, and start to grow. This slide uh, shows this interfering vegetation, the oriental bittersweet vine, which I, which I described a minute ago. Um, this is up in the Mountain Street uh, Reservoir area. There aren't any trees under that bittersweet. I think you can see that uh, that would be a pretty poor picture if you were trying to show somebody what a forest looked like. Um, some of these areas where the bittersweet is really, uh, it grows to that, that, uh, that amount of thickness and, and matting over the forest area would require a considerable amount of, of effort to bring that type of land back to a forested condition. And um, that's, that's a real issue in terms of land management from a water, su water supply perspective. And I'll talk about that a little bit more as we go on. Um, here's a picture of a red pine plantation that was planted probably 80 years ago or so. Definitely in decline. <coughs> um, these have a, the red pine is, is attacked by an array of, array of issues. Um, ironically, when I see these trees fall over, they were planted in the plantation originally by the city to be harvested as a, as a way of raising revenue. Um, and they've, they've sat there, um, and they, I think they were thinned out at one point, but um, clearly nothing has happened <coughs> in terms of that part of the forest. 
And um, at this point, if these trees aren't salvaged within the next 10 years or so, um, probably most of them will end up on the ground. And there's some bittersweet in that area as well. So it's a, a challenging part of the forest management for us. There's a picture of a, of a grapevine. I had varying photos. I was trying to figure out what to, what to show to try to illustrate this. I think what I want to say about this slide is that grapevines tend to grow um, along with a tree, and they can grow up to the crown of a tree and actually smother, smother um, the canopy of a tree and, and cause a lot of problems in some areas of the forest. We have a fair amount of grapevine. What this, what this shows really is, is the size of that vine and how long it's been growing to get to reach that diameter. So you get a sense that some of the forest land, which used to be an orchard or other parts of a farm, have a lot of these types of conditions that we're trying to deal with now. There's another picture right in front. Some people may have seen this. This is right in front of the Mountain Street Reservoir. Um, the tall trees there are red pine, and the, there's a lot of uh, interfering vegetation, and there's some bittersweet. Um, there's also uh, some poison ivy vines and other things that are growing up there. But um, this type of situation is very close to the water. Probably only mechanical controls could be used to try to uh, get some of these vines under, uh, under control. The trees, as they stand like that, can't be harvested or used really for much of anything. And eventually, if we don't do something to control the vines and, and try to regenerate the forest in this area, these trees will fall and the bittersweet will pretty much just take over and create a mat like I was showing in the previous photo. Um, here's a picture of the uh, elongate hemlock scale. <coughs> this is a photo log that we, we had posted on our website. Um, it's just a uh, you know, a pretty good picture, I think, of uh, what's impacting a lot of the hemlock population in, in our area and, and in the watershed. Um, we also have evidence uh, of some woolly adelgid in the, uh, in the watershed as well that's having some adverse impacts on the health of some of the hemlock trees. So moving uh, to the next step, so that was sort of the forest in transition, a lot of slides that show what we, what we have and some of the conditions that uh, we're trying to work with. Um, we have a number of silvicultural practices that are defined in the stewardship plans. Basically log logging and, and timber harvest uh, are some of the things that are described. And I, certainly the part of the plan that has got everybody's attention at the moment. Um, and so I wanted to talk a little bit about how these plans are put together. Um, some of the factors that we consider when we, when we consider doing logging in the watershed. Um, I think it's important to note the first bullet there, it says, we don't plan on doing any cutting where the land is too steep, where there are wetlands, feeder streams, vernal pools, or where, uh, the, or where it would just simply be too close to the reservoirs, or if there are too many invasives. These are some areas that we just, we totally avoid <coughs> even considering uh, doing logging. So for the Ryan West Waitley reservoirs that I showed you earlier, um, of about seven, 1,700 acres that we own, we determined uh, there's about 1,700 acres that are suitable for some type of logging, and there's about 630 acres we've identified right off the bat as no cut. So it's about 27% we identified in the stewardship plans where we wouldn't do any work. That doesn't mean we're going to do all, we're going to do cutting in all the 1,700 acres. It just means that. The first screening process is to identify where you don't even want to think about um, doing any logging. We went through the same uh, type of analysis on the Mountain Street Reservoir, and we came up with about 96% of the watershed area that we own is no cut because we have a variety of issues out there with interfering vegetation, too close to the water, too steep, um, you know, these other sorts of things um, we're taking into account and, and we're proposing that the majority of the Mountain Street Reservoir not be, um, not be logged at this point. Um, some of the other goals of the silviculture are, to, are really to promote uh, mature white pine and red oak. There's a lot of crowding in the canopy and thinning and doing some of the other logging that we're doing will actually help promote uh, more mature heights and uh, health of the white pine and red oak. Um, and also providing more sunlight, so providing more sunlight around those crowns of existing trees that we didn't cut will help them in, in creating sunlight that reaches the forest floor. will also um, help with multiple canopy heights as smaller trees begin to grow in those areas that are open. Um, we're also looking at less reliance on certain tree species, 
non-native type trees that are in the watershed disease trees or, or trees that are <coughs> impacted by pests. So while we're not targeting any specific type of tree for <coughs> removal, what we are saying is that there are certain trees like red oaks, white pine, that are very, very healthy in the watershed and they grow and they last for decades and decades. And those are the types of things that we're trying to encourage in the forest. And I have a note, I've got these notes written here. Um, I have the word patience on this. These are time frames, these are not our time frames, the things that we're doing. The time frame, <coughs> the time frame that we're looking at right now is when you walk out there or, or you see a picture of a stump, that is today. But that's not why we do this work. We do this work because we're 20 years, 40 years, 60 years trying to advance the health of the forest. And these aren't, these aren't time scales that we're used to. So you have to have a little bit of a vision to understand what it is that uh, is being accomplished here and recognize that there's a very good chance that the full impact of what we're doing, you will not see. I think that it's important to remember. And I, um, okay, next slide. Um, a little bit about uh, interfering vegetation, some of the bittersweet vines, the grape vines, some other uh, invasive species that we have out there that I haven't mentioned. As I did mention, it's a serious problem. If you look in the forest stewardship plan, <coughs> we actually ranked uh, all the watershed land based on the type of the type and amount of interfering vegetation that it had there, and we use that as a decision-making tool. But as we move on, we're, we'll be talking a little bit more about logging in a minute. But because of this large degree of infestation, we have to come up with a strategy to deal with it. So for now, as we start logging, we're avoiding it and we're not making it worse through the things that we're doing. Um, it's just not a condition that, uh, that we wanna make worse and we're avoiding it and that's why we ranked all the watershed lands so we figured uh, areas we felt would be safe to work. Um, there are mechanical control methods to control some of it, some of the grapevine work um, if you cut the grapevines and it's in a shaded area, those grapevines won't be able to grow back. Um, the, bitters the bittersweet is a, a slightly different um, type of problem. And um, there's been a fair amount of discussion around about, about the use of uh, herbicides in the, in the watershed. It's mentioned in the plan, and I guess I'll acknowledge that as the city engineer and the, pe the people that are responsible for the city's watershed, um, actually saying the word is something that we get paid to do. I know it's, it's hard to believe, um, but herbicides are part of any thinking related to dealing with interfering vegetation. We have not made the decision to use herbicides. The word herbicide is mentioned in the plan. There are public water suppliers that use integrated vegetation management, which is sort of a combination of mechanical controls and uh, hand application of herbicides. Um, Providence <coughs> Island uses um, IVM style management for interfering vegetation in their watershed. But we realize it's a very serious question, something that we don't take lightly, something that the Board of Public Works is very interested in. We've talked to them preliminar preliminarily about it when they approved the stewardship plans and they wanted to know more about it. And um, we don't have any approval from the board to use herbicides, but um, it's something that is a very important consideration and an important part of the discussion and to pretend that it's not just we wouldn't be doing our due diligence to pretend that that was not something that um, water suppliers did or, or it was a tool that people could consider. So um, that's sort of the interfering vegetation part of it. We are getting ready to uh, do some of the cutting of the grapevine, some of those mechanical controls which we can do which are less controversial. Um, so we're starting to do what we can but um, a lot of important questions that we'll be having. Um, this next slide, I was trying to explain to the counselors in the, in the, uh, during the site walk over the weekend about logging in that it, it's not deforestation. We still have a forest that's out there. I think people will be relieved um, to know. Um, but there's been a lot of numbers that have been thrown around too, and I'll, I'll readily admit the numbers are confusing when you look at the number of acres to be cut. Um, so I, I came up with an example. So the first bullet is under the, the cutting plants that we have uh, out now and our plans are to cut 341.5 acres. Now if I just met you on the street and I told you that and I didn't explain what it meant, you would think that we were gonna cut 341 and a half acres, which is a pretty large number. I mean that would be, probably would get my attention, your attention. But uh, 
So what does it mean if, if we look at an example of, we, we, we've numbered the stands, the foresters have numbered the stands. If we look at stand 19, the total stand area is defined as 45 acres. The cutting plan says that 27 acres of that 45 will be cut. So it seem, you seem to indicate that that's about you know, half of, of the, the amount of the stand, and 27 acres seems like a lot. By the time we actually issued the cutting plan and advertised it, the 27 acres was advertised as 20 acres. But more importantly, if you look at the actual trees that are to be removed and the openings that are to be created, within that 20 acres, there's only an opening of about an acre and a half that's actually created. So the numbers are difficult in the forestry business to understand exactly what they mean. And um, we've had a couple of forest walks. and. When you can see the work that's being done, it gives you a little bit more of an appreciation of um, the work that's actually being done rather than just reading it on the plan. And we do encourage people to read the plans, but I guess that would be my word of warning that if we say we're cutting 341 and a half acres, we're not really cutting 341 and a half acres. It's something that's a very tiny fraction of that. So we had some uh, questions about the logging details. Do we just... Um, do we just allow the logging companies to come in and, and uh, <coughs> cut the trees that they like and, and do what they want to do and leave after we tell them what area we want them to do? And it's actually quite a bit different than that. Um, every tree in a stand is marked by the forester. So if a tree is to be removed, it's marked. If a tree is to stay, it's marked. Um, so the trees that are protected and which are to be logged are identified in blue paint. Um, access and log landings are defined <coughs> in the plan. Um, so the routes where they go, we tell them where the equipment can drive and how they get to where they need to go. If they're going to st um, stack logs um, as part of the project, then we identify that where that can happen. And we can also identify the time of year restrictions. So if there are certain uh, reasons for habitat reasons or other, other um, important reasons in terms of sensitivity of the watershed to certain things, we'll identify time of year restrictions. And we can also, and we do specify the type of equipment used with keeping in mind um, specifying equipment that would have the least impact on the land. Um, this photo shows a blue arrow on that tree. And the, black, the black birch is marked with an arrow. The arrow indicates that's the main travel route that the loggers uh, should use. Um, the black birch also has a hor horizontal stripe, which means it'll be counted as timber and it'll be cut by the, uh, by the logger as they're out there. Um, the black birch beyond the, the tree with the arrow was marked for firewood. Um, so we carefully lay out the travel routes and we carefully determine <coughs> which trees will stay and which will go. And if you go out there, you'll really see in, in some areas that have been logged, it's really hard to tell. You have to be a little bit of a Sherlock Holmes to figure out what was actually done because the work, um, the work was so carefully laid out and, and, um, and it's really hard sometimes just to tell where it was done. Um, this is a picture of a timber harvester. Um, this type of machine, which we used on a cutting project that we're involved in right now, um, is helpful when there's a large number of small or medium-sized trees to be cut that don't have a lot of value. The work gets done in a pretty efficient manner. Um, the logs, uh, the logs are, the trees are cut, and then logs are left in small piles that are that are picked up by a Ford, or and I have a picture of that. Um, larger trees are still cut by a logger standing on the ground using a chainsaw, so that will be something that you'd be more used to seeing. But these, these types of equipment are very efficient. Um, we had a timber forwarder that was working, um, collecting logs in the forest over the weekend. I think the counselors on both days were able to see um, this piece of equipment, which is, um, it's actually, it's impressive to watch it work in the, in the watershed. It's uh, for a large piece of equipment, uh, it's graceful in terms of its ability to pick up very heavy things and, and to store them in the back and get them to the log landing. Um, it does a good job and it, it prevents damage to the trees in the forest that we want to leave untouched. I've got a few uh, photos here now of uh, the results of some of the work that we've done. And I think, I, I can't help but think of this analogy if there are any hockey players that uh, that are with us either on TV or here within the room. When you learn to play hockey, one of the things that they tell you is you, you always need to look up. Because if you don't, there's a good chance you'll be checked or something else that will be provide a little discomfort for you. And it and that's what I think about when we do when we do the logging. So in this particular case, uh, Mike took a picture of 
um, of a thinning project that we did. And what you see is that these crowns of these um, red oaks are free to grow. These, these will be pretty happy trees when, when it starts to get a little warmer because they were really um, surrounded by a lot of other trees in a very thick canopy with a lot of competition and they were unable to spread out. So in this particular case, by, by opening up the crowns of these trees, these trees will, go, will, will grow um, taller, more vigorous, uh, and stronger, and they'll, they'll grow for decades. Um, <coughs> I, there's a, another thing about these, these photos on the, uh, we've got deadlock, uh, dead hemlock, excuse me, on the right side of the oaks that we left, because that'll provide a range of um, ha habitat for a range of species, <coughs> including woodpeckers, birds, and other small mammals. And we have uh, other hemlocks in the, in the background. It's a little hard to see, but you can see that their crowns are, are thinning, and that's um, probably because of the scale and woolly adelgid that I talked about a minute ago. <coughs> this is a picture of a, of a logging road with a stream crossing, so probably one of the most um, sensitive type of um, logging roads that we would have on a logging job. Generally, we avoid all stream crossings. We, it's not something that... Um, we seek to do on, a, on occasion on a project, you'll have a stream crossing like we show here. Um, in this particular case, the logger used slash and small trees that were laid down on the approaches to the stream and in the stream to create the stream crossing. At the end of the job, the poles and the, and the slash in the stream will be removed, but it'll be left in the stream banks to protect against erosion. I have a slide about slash. Slash is basically the tops of trees or branches that come off from trees that have been cut. So it's kind of, you can, you can sort of get the flavor. It's, it snowed on that, on some of the slash there. I've got a picture. I'll talk about that in a minute. Um, all stream crossings are addressed in the forest cutting plan, and they're designed to prevent sediment in the, in, from entering the stream. And of course, the cutting plans are approved by, by DCR before we can even advertise for them. Um, here's another opening. Um, I think this was one of the areas that, uh, that the councilors saw also this weekend. Um, this is pretty much still a forest. Um, we didn't do much here other than to try to clear out some of the canopy around, um, <coughs> around the trees that were left here, which basically are some white pines and oaks. Um, and you can see in this photo where there is sunlight reaching, reaching the ground. Um, and again, we've left hemlocks in this particular area, some of them that are, that are in decline, but we recognize that there are benefits to, uh, to leaving some of these hemlock trees there as well. Another picture of thinning. Um, I like this picture. This is one of those ones, if you were walking in the forest, you'd have a hard time figuring out what was done. But this was part of the, part of the work that we did. Um, this post harvage image is, uh, slender oaks and hemlocks that were in a dense grove. Thinning was designed to give more light to the tree crowns by removing competing trees. Most of the trees cut in the project were black birch and hemlock. So um, that gives you a pretty good idea. So some of the things that we're doing weren't clearing, but more thinning, and the result would be something like this. Here's the slash, uh, picture of slash, um, which is something that um, we, by design, leave on the ground to protect and enhance the soil. Um, the slash uh, basically is, I started to mention, the branches, tops, and other parts of the tree that are left behind in the logging operation after the trunk of the tree is taken. Um, during the harvest, the, we have a lot of slash out there that you've seen. The <coughs> slash acts as a mat um, to reduce potential impacts of logging equipment on the soil. Over time, the slash will protect the soil and ultimately decompose and improve it. There's also a lot of habitat value to leaving the slash on the ground like that. Um, so there, there's a lot of good reasons to leave it. There would be some reasons to take it out, but in the forest, aesthetics aren't really a, a huge driver for us in this case. This is a photo of uh, a log landing. Obviously the result of <coughs> logging activity in the watershed is a pile of wood that gets, gets hauled off in a truck somewhere. Um, it, for this particular project, um, local markets were the vast majority of the wood that was um, that was removed. Uh, a lot of it was firewood. Um, there were some other um, hardwood logs that went to went to a, a mill in Vermont. But the vast majority was was uh, in New York or Vermont or Massachusetts. Even in Whateley, some of the firewood stayed. 
Um, we had a load, we had one load of red pine that went to Canada. Um, we don't actually have a say in where the material goes. It's really up to the, the logging contractor that gets the job to find the markets and market where it goes. In this particular case, a lot of it was local. Um, in the next, the next time we do a cutting project, that may not be the case. We're not, you know, we don't have any control over that part of it. This is a slide uh, that indicates forest regeneration. It was a slide that a colleague of mine at, at DCR at Quabbin sent to me. And, and I think it's, it's a, it, it illustrates the difference in, in an area that was cut over, um, over a six year period. So on the left, you sort of have this close up of what the stumps were when they did the logging job. And then at the right, you can see what the opening looks like six years later and the fact that some of the the new trees um, are starting to grow up in the area that was cleared. So a little bit about the science of what we're doing. These, I'll, I, I will take credit for this slide, not Mike. Uh, I'm the engineer, not the scientist. So, um, But I think uh, the concepts that are used here are really not too fancy. Um, forest land is the best land, uh, land use for water quality. So. Obviously, having forested land and land that hasn't been developed will be the most protective and will provide the cleanest water for the reservoir. A diverse forest is more resilient to change. Um, I think that makes sense for the, for the long run. It will be more sustainable to have a diverse forest of different age and tree species. Um, careful silviculture is sustainable. Um, the sun will rise in the morning and it will reach the trees and the forest floor, and these trees will grow, if, whether it's mature trees that we've left and we've opened up their crowns like I started to show, or whether it is in fact sunlight that reaches the forest floor and some new trees start to grow in those areas that were open. Um, these are fairly um, basic concepts in terms of managing forest land in a watershed. And in the last, the last quote's not really science, but I think it's, it's illustrative in that for, forestry is practiced by the vast majority of public water suppliers <coughs> in New England. So if there's a question about whether we're doing something unique. I know we went through the stormwater utility uh, issue. Many, many times we were asked the question, have, have other communities done this? What are other communities doing? How are they approaching it? What, 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 what does it mean for the city of Northampton? And in this particular case, um, there are many, many public water suppliers that rely on service water reservoirs that do forestry. And I have a, I have a short list. It's New York City, Boston, Springfield, Pittsfield, Fitchburg, Concord, New Hampshire, Hartford, MDC, New Haven, Connecticut, Providence, Rhode Island, Portland, Maine, Worcester, and there are many, many, many more. So <coughs> the concepts that we use here are, um, are, are sound and, and basic and, and employed by the vast majority of water suppliers. Um, there's been some information that has been circulated to the councilors about, uh, well, it's sort of about the Quabbin Reservoir. There was some comments in particular um, that came out of a, a process that the Quabbin went through a couple of years ago. Um, there was a moratorium on forestry practices at, at the Quabbin. Um, they took a break to answer a lot of public questions and concerns about how they were dealing with their forests there. Quabbin's much larger than our watershed. Their issues are much more complicated. But the science and some of the, some of the basic concepts that apply are, you know, would be considered universal in my mind. There's a long public exhaustive record about the science behind watershed and forestry as it applies to Quabbin and, and the industry in general. Um, in November of 2012, there was a document called, it was a, a review of the Massachusetts Division of Water Supply Protection Watershed Forestry. <coughs> so that was a, a review of how the state manages all its forest, land, and watersheds. And it was prepared by the Science and Technical Advisory Committee um, which was an independent panel of 14 researchers. So it was a very, uh, I felt like it was an extremely thorough process that included a lot of independent um, scientists and people that were really evalu evaluating what the state's approach was to managing forests and on state land. Um, there, were, there were public comments to that report in early 2013. I just want to point out that uh, Eric Shivian, who is a medical doctor, submitted comments on this um, on this report, there were his personal comments. I think they were well thought out, um, and he, he had certainly his own. Uh, I guess the point I want to make about it is that there were his personal comments. They were not the comments of Harvard University. 
that was um, misidentified in the Gazette article, so I feel it's important just to say that there were his personal comments, they weren't from Harvard University, and they weren't peer-reviewed comments. I think they were probably thoughtful, well-intended comments, and based on research that that particular individual did, but it, uh, the point is that they came out in, as a result of the Quabbin process. Um, the state, in turn, they had a stack of public comments that was probably like this, and they, in turn, reviewed those comments, and then they provided a response to those comments. And all of that science and information is available online. I have the link there. Um, it's really interesting. If you really <coughs> want to know what happened to Quab and a lot of these details, uh, I would say, you know, take a weekend and, and, and read it all. Um, the I guess the last thing I want to leave you with is that the Quab and Forestry Program has restarted and they've got some logging contracts out now. They took a break. There was a moratorium. I think it was for an extended period of time, four or five years, something like that. But um, they're getting ready to start with their forestry programs again. A little bit about the public process and notices and things. How do people know what we're doing um, at the Public Works Department? Um, the Board of Public Works at one of their um, one of their meetings adopted the forage stewardship plans. We had Mike Mori, the forester, come in and provide a detailed overview of the contents of the plans. The board reviewed them and they voted in July of 2012 to adopt the plans as the direction that the watershed should move in. Um, we're, uh, we're doing some outreach efforts as part of these stewardship plans. We've led to date two forest walks to discuss the forestry plans that we have uh, and what the watershed work will entail. We did one pre-harvest in November uh, 9th of this past year and we just did one on February 15th um, during the actual logging job. So. People could come out and we could tell them what we're doing and explain um, what our goals are and, and so they can take a look around and see what it looks like. Um, we send out annual consumer confidence reports to all water customers every year. You'll be getting one in your bill um, soon. We have a little section there, a couple of paragraphs about watershed protection. We've mentioned um, forestry programs and updates in that, uh, in that consumer confidence report. We do post information on the website and the blog related to for, for things related to watershed. When we buy land or we do forestry or we, we receive a grant, um, we try to let people know what we're doing. When the stewardship plans were first approved, um, Mike, our forester, and Nicole went on uh, the Bill Newman show just to talk about the stewardship plans to let people know the board had adopted them and what the, what the goals of those plans were. As we've started to get into imp implementation, um, abutting notification is a big part of what we do in compliance with the Forest Cutting Practices Act, uh, Mass General Law Chapter 132. We let people know what we're doing uh, in the watershed. All the logging, uh, we, we run ads in the Daily Hampshire Gazette and the Greenfield Recorder for, for logging bid ads. And then every contract that's approved related to watershed protection or forestry is reviewed and approved by the Board of Public Works in their public meeting, so it shows up on their agenda. Meeting minutes and the, all the meetings are videoed and available for inspection. So those are some of the things that, that go on so that people know what, um, what we're doing in the watershed. Um, as you probably would imagine, like most things, there's a lot of regulatory oversight in, in terms of the things that we, we do. Um, Department of Environmental Protection, both they do both watershed inspections and they also keep a close eye on all things related to the city's water supply. So they're well aware of the things that we're doing. The Department of Conservation and Rec Recreation approves the forage stewardship plans. They, they also approve each cutting plan before we hire uh, a logger to do any work. Compliance with this Forest Cutting Practices Act also kicks in the Natural Heritage and Endangered Species Program, the Weapons Protection Act. We notify the local conservation commissions about the types of things that we're doing. And then lastly, the um, DCR Green Certification Program also documents um, the implementation of the programs that we do, and they do field inspections to see uh, how the work gets done. A uh, little bit about program uh, financing. Uh, these are all recent numbers, so forestry and related costs up to this point for uh, the main watersheds I talked about, and also Roberts Meadow, 126,000 roughly on, on uh, these related finance <coughs> costs. Um, Department of Conservation and Recreation has given us grants to the tune of about $42,000. We, 
which we're quite proud of. The DCR is supportive of the things that we're doing and the fact that they review the work that we do and they support it financially, um, we believe is, is important. Um, to date, we have a timber revenue of 40, about $46,000. So the forestry balance to date um, is in the red, about $37,822. Um, there's a slightly larger number floating around um, out there in the universe, and there's probably a lot of different ways to calculate it. If you were to take an estimate of the time that Nicole Sanford, <coughs> our senior environmental scientist, spends on forestry work and the time that I spend working with Nicole, that adds up to an amount that would increase that deficit. Um, so you can you can choose to decide how you want to look at the numbers on this. Um, the last bullet that I have there, well, I guess a couple of other things. Long-term value growth of the timber is a goal. So you'll see it drives the loggers crazy because the red oak and white pine that we have out there are probably the most valuable trees in terms of value. And those really aren't the trees that we're cutting down and allowing those trees to grow taller and larger and bigger over time is really an asset for the city. If those trees were ever to be cut down in the future, 20 years, 50 years from now, that's an investment in the value growth of the timber. Um, the program costs are monitored. If people are wondering whether we pay attention to this or not, we, we do pay attention to this. Um, every time the board approves a contract, they ask me if we're making money. Um, so Terry Colane is is the one that has his finger in my chest at most meetings, wondering if we're being fiscally <coughs> prudent. Um, the, so the program costs are monitored. Um, as we've mentioned before, profit is not the primary goal, um, but profit is important. Um, we're not looting, but by doing forestry types of activities, you're removing forest products, wood products that have a value. Um, because we're starting on a 10-year plan, the program is $37,000 in the red at this point. Um, but as I mentioned way, you know, at the very beginning, the city used to use uh, logging projects to fund the timber revenue account to buy land. So just historically, if you looked at what the city has done in the past, it is a program that ran in the black in a pretty significant way in terms of the ability to take that money and then invest in protecting other land to protect the water supply. And then the last bullet is um, the estimate in the stewardship plan, if you were to take a look for it, the total timber value on all the land that the city owns is $2.59 million, of which we have no intention of cutting and cashing that $2.59 million in. But the reason I put the bullet in is to let you know and let, uh, let everybody know that it's a valuable asset for the city of Northampton. We're trying to be quite careful and protective in the way we deal with this asset for the long term, for the you know, for the next several decades as, as far as we can plan. And, but our, our goal is not to, uh, to spend money frivolous, frivolously and do things in the city of Northampton that cost people money. Uh, so that's, that's the financing slide. Um, quick slide, we've had uh, a number of letters and email that various folks have submitted in support of the work that the city's doing, basically stating that sustainable forestry makes sense and um, various reasons why people feel that way. Um, those have been distributed to the counselors so they can see that. And then I'll wrap up um, with a quick summary. Probably not quick. I don't know how long I've been going on, but I appreciate your patience. Um, <coughs> this, the trees have grown. Yes, thank, thank you. And we're happy. I mean, we're happy about the trees. Um, the watershed is managed by a team of staff professionals and science and forestry consultants. Um, sometimes I feel like I need to say that. Usually when people find out I work at Public Works, they ask if I filled any potholes today. And what they don't realize is that we have people with master's degrees in engineering and master's degrees in environmental conservation and lots of other things that um, provide the qualifications for us to do a good job for the city. So I'll say that uh, the city staff, we've got city staff professionals and we hire. Um, people that are experts in science and forestry to help us with these important projects. Um, oversight, really day to day, everything that we do is provided by the Board of Public Works. Um, a very caring, interested, hardworking board like yourselves, although their meetings don't typically go this long. Um, forestry and public watershed land has a long history, as I mentioned, in, not only in Northampton, but for public water supplies across New England. Forestry um, is really a way of life in terms of protecting water quality. 
Um, acquiring land and maintaining the forest uh, are really the key components that we use to protect water quality. Um, watershed and forests are closely regulated by the state, all the different agencies I mentioned. And the public processes and outreach will continue as the forestry program proceeds. I think that this was a, a big surprise for people. Um, there was a lot, certainly a lot of interest. We, it's not often that I come in front of the council to talk about things like this. And I love talking about why public works matters, but um, we feel like the process has been terrific because, it, because it's really <coughs> allowed us to get more information out to people about what we're doing. We're going to continue to hold walks in the watershed so we can explain to people on the types of activities that are planned and what the goals are. Um, so I guess I'll end it there. And um, if there are any questions, I'd be happy to try to answer them. Uh, thank you, Jim. And Councilor Adams. Um, Jim, there, there are, there's another train of thought that, that, uh, that doing nothing is the best approach for, for the forest and for the ecology. And, you know, and in considering that, considering that there are two different schools of thoughts and school, two, different, two different theories, um, I have to wonder that w there are opposing views on it, but we do know that it's costing the city a substantial amount of money, about $100,000. Um, so while the jury's out on whether it's good for the ecosystem, we, we know it's costing a lot of money. So my concern is that um, there's no guarantee that we're helping the ecosystem. There's no guarantee based on the fact that there are different thoughts, schools of thought out there. And obviously the city is closed in one school of thought. But based on the, the, the fact that there, there, there are competing thoughts out there, <coughs> it's possible that maybe it's not worth the expense. Well, I think there there are opposing opinions, um, and <coughs> I think the science is sound in terms of how you manage a watershed forest. And I think anecdotally, the fact that just about every water supplier manages their forest in an active way um, is pretty reasonable anecdotal evidence that there's good solid science behind it. I think if you look at uh, the Quabbin, uh the Quabbin report that was done and a lot of the work that went through, they went through a very extensive public process with a lot of vetting, with a lot of people that are smarter than me. And the result of that process was that active forestry management in a watershed makes a lot of sense. So I think from that standpoint, I'm not seeing a lot of dissension in terms of whether it makes sense for water suppliers to manage forest. I think that has been clearly shown. I think some people rightfully have their own opinion about whether you should cut trees down on public land, that certainly is a, a, valid, a valid opinion, a valid opinion if someone wants to think that. But I wouldn't say that it's opposing science. And then in terms of the, the price of the program, I mentioned, you know, we're about $37,000 in the red based on contracts. If you want to add my time in there and Nicole's time and ramp it up to 100, or you could add the mayor's time and make that number higher. Or I think he signed every contract as well. Um, there's a lot of, you can play a lot of numbers with the games, a lot of games with the numbers, but I, I, I took your point. number. What's that? I did take your number. My number was 37, not 100. The total was 100. The city is losing money approximately $102,000. That's, that's, it spent $126,000 on forestry consulting and approximately 64000 on direct and indirect labor costs, offset by, offset by some of the wood sales and the DCR grant. It's our number if, if you include salary cost. If you look at the contracts that are involved in the, in the implementation of the work, the number is 37, as I had presented on the slide. But suffice to say, no matter how the math is done, whether you, whether you include my time or not, whether it's 100000 or $40,000, in the end, the program will be in the black. And I think we're in year one of a 10-year plan, um, and we're trying to deal with a lot of different issues in terms of getting the forest stewardship plan um, up and running. But um, we've been accused of looting the forest. I wouldn't, I, I would say that there's probably money that will result from the forestry activities. Thank you. Other questions? Yes. Uh, Council of Arch. Um, I want to thank you for the presentation. Um, I have <coughs> emailed our Council President and Councilor at Large of the great concerns that quite a bit of my residents have <coughs> of seeing a figure which went viral on the price of the logging 
And I have great concerns as counselor. Um, Adams has also is we're hearing two different sides. Is it good to go ahead and do logging in the forestry or not? Or should we be doing it? But when we see we're losing money, I don't like seeing that. Yeah, I don't know. I'll, I guess I'll say it again. In the end, the program won't lose money, and that we'll have proceeds from the work that we do that will go into the timber revenue account that I mentioned, and then that money will be available for just more land as other properties come up for sale. Um, the Board of Public Works is very careful. They monitor all the costs of all the programs, everything that gets done by the Department of Public Works. They, they watch the numbers. It, um, it's, it's, I, I, I get a little uncomfortable when we're talking about losing money, investing money, making profits, and so on and so forth, because the principal motivation, this is an investment, if you look at it that way, as opposed to um, this is an investment on protecting the watershed. And we spend money that we never realize a return on when we do roads, when we do any other infrastructure system and maintenance stuff. We don't get money back for maintaining the levees and dikes. Um, there's no revenue to be generated from that. So, and so I think when we start to couch in terms, I mean, you're either arguing one of two things. We're either patsies and we're getting a raw deal on our profit scheme, <laughs> which if we were doing this as a profit business and enterprise, that would clearly be true. We're, we're getting scammed. But point in fact, actually, I don't know. I'm not speaking for all the councils, but that's not the motivation. And I don't think, and I think, I hope it's not the motivation. And I get the, uh, and Jim has expressed as much, that the profit is not the principal objective here. The turning over and make and generate money from this. This is not the impetus for the plan, for the plan and management. Although that has been accused too. It's been, it was accused both ways. We either, they were accused of, trying to generate a profit at the expense of the, the public forest and not succeeding, I guess was the argument, in, do, in doing a bad job of it and losing money at the, in, in the bargain. And Councilor Adams. Well, uh, Councilor Carney. Thank you. thank you, Jim. Um, and thank you for guiding the walk last week um, out in the watershed area. I, I guess the thing, the um, biggest piece that I take about from, from most of this, especially around the finance piece, is that um, it, 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 we're able to we're able to use those resources from the from the uh, timber account to purchase more land, and I just know how many times we've been able to do that through this body to approve the that uh, to approve that expenditure, and what a benefit what value that is to expanding the watershed area and protecting that resource for the city. Um, so I, I'm really, uh, I really value that piece of the work. Thank you. Oh, sorry. My, my really simple point was that, you know, it wasn't really about whether or not we should be making more off of it or not, um, or less. My simple point was that given that there are two different opposing views out there, and, it, and my concern was that it's costing the city um, $100,000. Uh, well, that's my concern. But to learn that, you know, eventually we'll be in, in the black. That's important. Um, relative to the science, and um, I think all the counselors have gotten a considerable education that they had not anticipated. <coughs> good. Actually, good. The discussion is good and appropriate. The, I'm seeing represented essentially two, as Councilor Adams described, two philosophies on how on forest management. One is not management, and one is um, do nothing. And and some of the information that I've seen supporting the do nothing argument is things like um, carbon sequestration, destroying carbon sequestration of a millennia that have been ravaged in the course of time. Every time we remove a tree, we 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 actually reintroduce more carbon, uh, either uh, just in, in the process of developing it. And I suppose that would make sense if these were actually primitive primordial forests, primeval forests, I'm sorry, that, 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 but this is a second, in some cases, third growth forest, uh, depending 
on how you look at it. The, as you pointed out, the state, the region, the New England was almost 80% denuded at one point for pastoral, pastoral purposes. And so we're talking <coughs> thousands of years of, of carbon sequestration. We're talking 100 years or so with selective cutting. In, in, and I, I think what I find really compelling is, and in fact, actually, there's been an argument that uh, a peer-reviewed studies, there are, uh, the argument has been advanced that peer-reviewed studies saying doing nothing is the best course of action, while in the absence of any peer-reviewed uh, determination that doing something or maintenance uh, is, is suggesting that that is what the Department of Public Works is opted for. Uh, and I hear you arguing that the science that's been advanced and and subscribed to by any number of people that you've put up here, including um, David Foster, who I believe is cited by the person who's challenging, <coughs> um, <coughs> as as stating otherwise. That's a leading question, of course. But is that the case? I mean, do you, do you consider that there's peer-reviewed science that that supports um, the, these plans? Yeah, I do. Which is why we're doing it. I think it's become controversial about cutting trees on public property. And the extension of that concern has reached this type of situation where it's watershed land. I didn't, it, and this concern about cutting trees on watershed land. Well, it's been framed in any number of ways, actually. Yeah, that's true. I, I guess. Yeah. Council was down either. When was the um, the management plan enacted originally? You, you said it was the year that. 2012, the recent one. Okay. Was there one in the 90s you there mentioned? There was one. Uh, he said the city was doing logging in the 80s and 90s. And I don't know if they had a stewardship plan. Um, right. I think they may have just done individual cutting plans. So they look at the forest and decide we're going to work in this area and this is what we're going to do. Spending the money on these stewardship plans, you look at everything holistically and, and you look at the whole forest. You look at the timber, you look at the habitat, you look at environmental sensitive areas, and then you look at the interfering vegetation, and you look at all of those different things and then you try to make decisions in the most informed way that you can. What we're doing by spending more money up front is resulting in a much more careful implementation plan than what the city used in the 80s. Um, and that, and we, we chose that by design. Right. So we use this holistic plan as you describe it now. It's not the way we've always done it. Right. It's fair to say that in the future we may change our plans again, but we don't know. We just do the best we can right now and we try to keep improving how we take care of our forests, and we are where we are right now, right. according to our best, but the best evidence available to us and our experience in the past and the best research. Any other questions, points, thoughts? This has been, this has been, <laughs> I really appreciate it. I actually, and, and I, I, I should acknowledge that you brought in um, some other people for supporting answers, but uh, it's a long night. <laughs> for us, longer still. But this is, um, uh, I'm very grateful for this discussion. I don't think the discussion ends now. And as I said, I should point out that it's a long discussion given the fact that the council has no authority over this in this, in this regard, but it's, it's worth having. So I do, I really appreciate that was That was a, an exhaustive summary. I remember I, I sent you some bullet point questions and uh, you you answered it in then some. Could be the last time the council ever asked me to come in front. Of you. <laughs> oh, you know, any opportunity to get a PowerPoint, we're there. Thank you very much, Jim. How's everyone doing? All right. Good to be brave. <laughs> Good to see. Um, the mayor's report. Do you have no? <laughs> Oh, yeah, uh, I'm sorry. Uh, 1036, that's my report. 1036, got it. Um, <laughs> we'll accept the motion for the minutes, for the minutes, the last meeting. So moved, second it. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 aye.
<laughs> I know, I, I leaped over. Sorry. Sorry, that's it. Yes. Uh, any any objections? So we are on minutes right now. Uh, Council Murphy made the motion. I think Councilor Adams seconded. Right, and it was. <coughs> okay, we're back. Those are all minutes. Um, before us now is the resolution, if you recall from uh, the previous council, a resolution to support private sidewalk. It's been sent back from Move to waive reading. With a recommendation. There's or a motion request to waive, to waive reading. reading. Is there a second? Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Oh. And move to refer Same to uh, Social <coughs> Services and Veterans Affairs. Second. Is there any discussion on the referral? Councilor Labarge? Yes. Um, I know Councillor Klein from Ward 7 had brought it up in Social Services and Veterans Affairs that apparently um, there was going to be a vote on this to submit it into our committee. I agree with that, but I wish it had, this was done when it should have been done. But anyways, what we're planning on doing is having a couple of forms and listen to the public and then bring the resolution back. We might do some changes. No. Uh, any other questions on the referral, discussion on the referral? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Any abstentions? <coughs> Thank you. So that's been referred to what is now known as SSVCR, the sinking VCR. <laughs> <laughs> Um, one minute announcements. Thank you. Councilor Klein. <laughs> I um, just want to remind people again about a meeting on Tuesday about the rail trail extension. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, March 25th, 7 to 9 o'clock in the Leeds School Cafeteria. We're going to have um, Wayne Fiden, the Director of Planning and Sustainability, come to listen to community input. Uh, the biking community has also been invited, and uh, we'd like to see it. <coughs> Councilor O'Donnell. Um, there's going to be a small meeting for constituents, uh, mostly from the North Street um, section of Ward 3, but open to anyone on Tuesday, March 25th, uh, 5.30 to 7 o'clock, second floor of City Hall. It's just a constituent meeting. The others? Um, City Council will be marching in the St. Patrick's Day Parade in Holyoke uh, this Sunday. That's March 23rd for those of you checking your calendars. Um, there's uh, on Sunday, also March 23rd, there's coffee at JJ's Tavern in Florence from 9.30 to 10.15. Uh, the bus departs for JJ's, uh, from JJ's at 10.15 uh, a.m. and arrives in Holyoke at 11. And the parade begins at noon. That's when the first contingent steps off. For those of you frozen in the in the parking lot there in previous years, um, we're in the middle. So if you, if you want to base your calculations on when you should show up, <coughs> the, you could die of exposure out there. <coughs> but depending on what the weather is going to be like. So um, and there also there'll be a public <coughs> hearing on Thursday, April third, twenty fourteen, at seven o five here uh, and that's Ray the uh, capital improvement plan that the mayor has presented FY 2015 to FY 2019 so that will be a public hearing and I said that we'll see the mayor and <laughs> did, did, did you tell her that this was, okay <laughs> um, <clears throat> any other one minute announcements okay <sighs> these are petitions for street acceptance <coughs> acceptances, excuse me, there's, uh, I don't know if anyone wants to move them as a group. I'd like to move we'll them as a group and five to group. <laughs> <laughs> refer to the yeah. board of <laughs> uh, <laughs> head planning board. <laughs> okay, so the motion is to move Everything. one through four to refer to planning board and the board of public works. <laughs> That's uh, all those in favor of the referral? Aye. 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 Opposed? Thank you. <coughs> All right, this is a license for secondhand articles. This is, uh, this is Wild Mutation Records on 52 Main Street in Florence. A record store. So moved. Second. So moved. 
to, 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 to grant a license. Approve a license? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And second. Can I second? Any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Aye. Any abstentions? Thank you. Done the minutes. Uh, next up is the reports from uh, committees. Uh, the Committee on uh, EDLU, Ordinance. <coughs> uh, excuse me. We'll accept these as a group. Second. Any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Okay. Next up is appointments to, uh, we have the mayor is submitting a number of appointments. Um, I'm submitting the following names for appointment to the elected officials compensation advisory board in accordance with the ordinance 5-5. Each member shall serve a term of two years starting February 2014, <coughs> ending February 2016. <coughs> names are? Second. Okay, I'll read the names. Uh, Vicki Baum, Baum Holmes of uh, Florence, John Fortier of uh, Northampton, Dennis Helmus, also of Northampton, Jennifer Higgins, Northampton, Douglas Liu, Linda Matson, and Todd Thompson. So the motion's been made to approve. It came as a positive recommendation. They all came from positive recommendations. Okay. Uh, was there a second? Yes, I seconded. I thought you moved it. I moved it. You seconded. Well, I guess I seconded it. Okay. All right. So, a any discussion that come forward with, uh, from yes. from yes. Yes. positive, positive recommendation? Exhaustive interviews. Exhaustive. Yes. Any discussion on the, on the <laughs> the appointments? Um, okay. Um, all those in favor? Please. Aye. 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 Any opposed? <coughs> any abstentions? I'd like to move to take four, five, and six as a group. Yes. There's been a motion for four, five, and six to be moved as a group. Second, second. And it's been seconded. Any discussion? I should point out this is uh, the appointment of the planning board of uh, William Grinnell. Uh, There's also a new appointment to the Ag Commission of uh, Margaret Gifford and a new appointment to the Community Preservation Committee of uh, Linda Morley. Um, any, d any discussion on the candidates? Just that th this also had positive recommendation from the yeah. ordinance committee. Mm -hmm. Thank you for noting that. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Aye. Any abstentions? Uh, let's see. And this is take seven and eight as a group. Seven and eight have been moved as a group. Uh, there's a motion. Is there a second? Second. And this is uh, reappointments to the Central Business Architecture Committee. Uh, that was. Uh, Bruce Gravisky, uh, Alan Tierney, and Robert Walker, and then also reappointments to the Conservation Commission of Tim Partial and Steve Sauter. Move to suspend Rule 30. There's been a motion to second. suspend rules for referral and seconded. Any discussion on that? All those in favor of suspending rules, please say aye. 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 Opposed? I'll accept a motion for the appointments. Councilor Murphy? Uh, this would be. The appointment to the license commission. I'm sorry, the license commission. <coughs> and not yet, not yet. Oh, the license commission get a, comes up next. Oh, so we need to finalize. This is this. seven we and eight. These. The council items move seven and eight. Because they're seven and eight, right? Yeah. yeah. Not nine yet. Not nine. No. That's nine. Will be there. So any discussion on seven and eight on those two uh, to the central business uh, architecture committee and the appointments of the cons I'd like to say something. Yes, um, I. I'm sure these are fine candidates, and I will certainly vote yes, but um, I would like to see us make a concerted effort and um, do some proactive outreach so we can see some kind of gender parity in these uh, realms. I think that we're very heavily <coughs> male representatives in both of those committees. So for the future, I would like to see us try and do some proactive outreach that way. I agree. That's all. Any other discussion? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Now, this is number nine. This is the appointment of the License Commission, Councilor Murphy. And I'd, I'd like to suspend Rule 30 on this one, too. Elaine Real is our former city solicitor. I really don't see why we need to send her to be evaluated by the Ordinance Committee. I think she's quite qualified to serve on the License Commission. Uh, so I'd like to. Let's suspend that Rule 30. 
Motion made and second to suspend the vote in favor. Aye. Aye. Any Nay. Opposed? Any, opposed? Any abstentions? The, um, by the way, this is appointment of the license commission Lane Real um, to replace the expiring term of Stephanie Levin. So I'll move appointment. Second. Second. No. Any discussion on it? I just, it's unfortunate we don't get to hear why she's interested in all that, those other things. That's why, that's why I voted no before, but I'm not voting against her appointment. Oh. Um, any further discussion on that point, on the, on the candidate? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Now comes the time, believe it or not. Well, actually, I would ask the council to consider extending beyond our regular time at this point before we recess in the finance. Move to extend past 11 o'clock, whatever rule that is. <laughs> what is it, 27? I don't know. <laughs> I second. 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 Any discussion? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 <laughs> Change your mind. Any opposed? Okay. Any passionate? All right. <laughs> <laughs> Caught me up short. Um, we're now <laughs> recessing into finance, and I figured we'd pass the gavel to Council Murphy, who chairs the finance. Are you going to read the roll? Yep. And then she'll give you the first yeah, exactly. Council Murphy? Here. Council Here. Council Present. Here. Now I can. So this is upon the recommendation of Mayor David Narkowitz that $98,000 be appropriated from the FY14 general fund undesignated fund balance to the legal services OM account. And the mayor is here to explain it. This is one of those accounts uh, that we often come back to you throughout the fiscal year. Um, in fiscal year 13, uh, last fiscal year, we spent $289,078 uh, in our legal account. Um, with this, tr we are projecting that for fiscal year 14, uh, we'll spend <coughs> under that at 273,000 is our current estimate to get to the end of the fiscal year. So this transfer um, of uh, of 98,000 would bring the total appropriation for legal services to 273, which we are estimating, you know, based on you know. Uh, you know, looking at the first uh, months of the fiscal year, that that's where we will end up. So this will help us to uh, to be able to finish out the fiscal year. So before questions, can somebody move this? Mm -hmm. Okay, great. So, mm -hmm. Councilor Barch? Yes. Um, Mayor, I want to thank Susan um, for giving me the information that yes. I requested. And because it's on the website and residents saw this, mm -hmm stating of a legal service for MO, thinking that it was one attorney. Mm -hmm. Can you explain how many attorneys this is actually coming? Yeah, so we have, um, you know, we have the city solicitor, obviously, who provides our primary legal counsel, but then we also have, uh, we have attorneys for collective bargaining. So we have um, attorneys that help us with labor. Uh, costs. We also have several, you know, we have a special counsel, for example, that we hired to advise on the bid um, uh, certification and petition process. Um, we have an, an environmental attorney who is advising us on some 21E issues uh, with DEP, so we hire outside counsel for that. Um, we obviously hired um, specialized counsel for the casino gaming issue. Um, so we have, uh, and Interestingly, we even I think we even have one attorney that we hire to adjudicate our dog, dog hearings. Uh, mm -hmm. So um, so so we have other outside counsel. But that so when you talk about the legal service budget, it's it's uh, the city solicitor manages it, but it's not all for just the city, city solicitor services. Mm -hmm. And again, this budget we are projecting that it's going to come in less than last year's uh, legal service budget, uh, and this transfer would put us there. Thank you. And we'd have a pretty good estimate because essentially this is just through June 30. Exactly. Finishing off. So we're, we're close exactly. enough to the end. Yes. Obviously, we, know what's coming up. No, we hope this is a good estimate uh, and that we won't have to come back to you again for it. But, but so we're doing the best we can. Um, and so this is where we are. Yeah. Any other questions in finance? 
No, but I think we're looking at two readings when it comes to the <coughs> All right. So if there's no other questions, all in favor of a positive recommendation? Aye. 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 But any opposed? And one other. Upon the recommendation of Mayor David J. Narkowitz, order that the sum of 300000 hereby is transferred from parking receipt reserve for appropriations to the general fund for replacement of the parking access and revenue system in the E.J. Gear parking garage. We have a motion on this one? So moved. Okay. And the mayor will explain this one to us. I was going to don my um, yellow jacket and my $5 bucket for this part of the evening, but actually Attorney Winston in his... Uh, public comments earlier, I think, made some salient points. This is, of course, a uh, transfer, and Mr. Pomerantz is here, and I can let him talk to you about the specifics of it, but um, this is an item that's been on our capital plan for several years, um, and it's actually part of my uh, capital program as well, um, but this is to replace the uh, failing uh, system in the um, E.J. Gar parking garage. Uh, when we began experiencing the problem with the uh, breakdown of the components, the inability to get uh, components from the, from the distributor and then the manufacturer, um, and just uh, the increased maintenance on it, um, we began looking at a more modern uh, and more robust system, including a system that had more modern features like credit card um, and did not rely on the very specialized uh, technology of these uh, cards, which were very expensive when people lost them. So um, we went out to bid. Uh, we put together some bid specs, went out to bid, um, and the bids, uh, I believe the bids just closed uh, this week. Um, we would like to move this project forward uh, and, and ask for the ability to um, transfer funds from the parking receipts reserved for appropriation account to get this project moving, um, as opposed to waiting until the uh, going through the normal capital budget process, um, which would mean we wouldn't be able to, uh, wouldn't even be able to sign a contract until June 30th or whenever the, you know, July 1 when the budget went into effect. We really feel this is a high priority issue. Uh, you know, we had the one malfunction um, that resulted in the, you know, the, uh, uh, the need to create an alternative uh, uh, system for collecting fees. And then more recently, we've had the issue of the card uh, shortage. Um, we just received another shipment of them um, from Germany. They were late, but it's been creating havoc. And just the machines themselves have become temperamental in terms of and needing a lot of uh, maintenance. So we really want to get the system replaced. So I was, would ask Mr. Pomerantz to speak to it quickly um, <coughs> about the actual system components, but that's what this order is about. Okay. Thank you, Mayor. Good evening, everybody. Um, as the Mayor said, we did go out to bid uh, for a new system. We opened the bids yesterday. Uh, we'll be looking at doing a scoping review starting tomorrow, uh, meeting with the contractor and the uh, sort of assumed vendor at this point to go over their proposal and their pro their plan and documents to see if it meets what the spec w uh, stated that was put out for bid. Uh, if it doesn't, we have some other vendors we can look at. Um, any of the vendors are going to tell us it's about 12 weeks from start to finish once the contract is signed to get the project completed. So that's another reason why we want to move on this immediately. Uh, because the components have to be basically manufactured, the system is put together, and the construction uh, schedule set uh, to get things installed in the garage and get the old system removed. Um, we were estimating about 300000 uh, as as the order is looking. Uh, the initial bid we got yesterday was 250000 So um, uh, we got some very good numbers, and uh, we'd like to proceed uh, as soon as we can to get things rolling. I don't, I don't understand entirely what this whole system um, is, is composed of. So you, ha you, have, you have the, I heard a reference to the, at the entrance of the garage where there was that malfunctioning. It, it, it encompasses that part of it, but what else? It just all the, all, everywhere, everywhere where you pay? It's the, dis it, the whole thing is a, is a system. So the, dis the change dispensers, where you put your card in to get it read, um, all that, uh, it's all tied into the same system. The gate has readers that read, that then <coughs> set signals that keep account of who's in the garage, how many cars are in the garage. But aside from, so, so, so you have the, 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 the one in the entrance, 
You have one of the areas where you pay. All of the pay and display machines. How many pay display and display machines do we? We have three. Three. Three of those, and yep. those are those are uh, that's all part of the system. What else is is the is the is the, is the section of the garage um, that's only for for pass holders? Is that part right. of the system? The permit system is is also tied into this the exactly. same system. Yes. Yeah. Is there anything else, or is that the whole system? The gate has a. There has to be a. a what, what do you call that? That's installed in the uh, in the pavement. Uh, uh, the loop system. It's a loop system, the de a detector system, right. so that when cars pass over it, um, that gets installed, and then the gate arms themselves, all of that. Um, and we're looking at a system that does that dispenses the uh, paper cards, the the, the paper cards that uh, are more common in in garages. Mm -hmm. um, and so, if someone loses that, it's not a twenty-five dollar item that we have to order from Germany to replace it. Um, so the paper cards and the technology has come a long way. We met with several of the vendors. I mean, you can crumple them up in your pocket, and they still work. They Will still these have work. receipts. What's that? Yeah, you'll have that ability. You'll have yes. a credit card, credit card ability, which we think is going to be great. Yeah. Um, Absolutely. Because uh, we often That's have. You know, one of the biggest issues is the change machines getting all fouled up. People waiting in line to just get change, or because you know, a lot of people just want to swipe and go. Um, it's what most cities have now. Um, so that's going to be a great feature. Plus, we have the ability to tie into, um, you know, to be able to get tie into our uh, system so we can monitor it remotely, uh, which is the other feature of the new modern uh, garage systems. So, I mean, I think ours was cutting edge at the time, but um, but it's it's the technology has changed so so rapidly. So uh, we just feel that this is a Given the problems we've been having in the garage, and the, you heard the, the concerns about the leaseholders, uh, mm -hmm. and that that was a result of the card shortage and the the garage filling up. But also the winter storms also meant a lot more people parking in the garage. But mm -hmm. um, we hope to eliminate those kinds of issues, as well as find a company that has a good maintenance <coughs> uh, you know, component. Um, that there's that there's maintenance that comes along with it. So, Councilor Down. Um, the, the sort of vision to put in credit card um, capability for other municipal lots, that's entirely separate. It's actually in our capital improvement program. There's right. another, pro there's actually a project in our capital improvement program to replace all the, the what do you call They're it? They're modules. The modules on the right. pay and display right. machines to have those also have credit card. But this, this you just want to get done quicker. We want to get it right. done because of the problems. But it's in the capital plan. Right. I think it's a $70,000 right. item. And basically, we'll go out to all of those pan display machines that you see right now. You basically pull the, the guts of it out, and you right. put a new one in, and it has a credit card capability. I think that's great. Exactly. Yeah. No, we, we again, we think that's a it, for convenience. It's also easier for, you know, uh, having to collect the funds. Um, so we just think it's a, it's a it's a great way to move. So. Councilor Klein, do you have a question? I, d I don't want to cry over spilt milk here, but I'm just curious. Um, did we get the life that we expected out of the the mechanisms that we've been using i mean when were they purchased and what was the projected lifespan as far as i can tell from the, the what's in the files that system was put in in 2005. so not a long period of time uh, and did it have some kind of projected lifespan have we lost money on that system i don't know if we've lost money but basically the, the between the headaches and having to get replacement parts um I'm not a, not as useful as I'm it could have been. Hair, because yeah. I'm like, <laughs> you know, we're, we like can't get these people to answer the phone, and you know, it's a. Yeah. I mean, at the time, this was, you know, when we got the system, we were going to be the first uh, municipality in North America that had the system, um, and then, you know, when we've had these problems, we've been calling around trying to figure out is there anyone else who has the system and. There isn't anyone else that we can find that actually has the system. So I think we were an early adopter, and I'm not sure that it, that it caught on. Um, as we've talked to the manufacturer, uh, or, and so, you know, that it's actually a system that's probably better suited for like a hospital or, um, or a large firm where you've got the same pool of people that are coming in every day because of the card thing. And so, you know, <laughs> as opposed to people who are coming from Connecticut and Boston and whatever, and they drive away with the card, don't think about it. Um, mm -hmm. So, uh, so anyway, that because we we even looked into when we had the recent card shortage, can we just call somebody else who has this garage and borrow some cards? 
think the closest place was like a, ho a hospital yeah. in down in Connecticut somewhere. In Connecticut, but the cards are not in software. You can't yeah. borrow cards from somebody else. So, so no. you know, the system we bought may have been a good system or seemed like a good system at the time. I don't know what the life expectancy of it is, but at this point, it's you know it costs us money every time it's down, and we have you know folks that can't find a place to park, and so I really believe we have to just move forward and get it replaced. Is it a moot point to ask for some kind of compensation? Oh, we've looked into, well, I, we've looked into more than just compensation. <laughs> I've had the city solicitor review whether we have any legal recourse given the delays we've had and the, but we really don't. I mean, we bought the system. It's, if there was any warranty, we're, we're well out of it at this point. So, um, no, I have, I believe me, I've looked into that just given the frustrations we've had. But I mean, being, a technology-based device, getting 10 years out of that before it goes obsolete is about par for the course. And it's got a mechanical component, and it's outside in the weather to boot. So right. it would seem to me that it's about lived its effective life. And then functionality-wise, it doesn't take credit or debit cards. So functionality-wise, it's right. worn out. Technologically-wise, mechanically, it's worn out. Mm -hmm. And it's causing us problems. And we'll be spending designated parking money on a real parking problem. So. It seems to make sense to me to. And the gate's been taken off about a thousand times. Run over. Run right. over. And, uh, and, and the other thing is, with 12 weeks, I mean, if we, we get rolling on this, it'll be in place for the return of the students and foliage season and all that. Yeah, we're hoping to time it so that we can have the least disruption during a period you know, and then have it in place for when things pick up again in the, in the fall. So. Any other questions? No. Okay, then in finance, all in favor of a positive recommendation? Aye. You need to Aye. sign this card. Then uh, those are the only two Sorry. items in finance, so a motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. 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 Aye. Aye. All right. Thanks for staying. Sorry. Beam back into the, our regular meeting. <coughs> and while it's still fresh in your memory, is your <coughs> synapses are starting to fade? Councilor <laughs> 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 Adams has already made a motion on the appropriation of $98,000 for the general uh, fund, undesignated fund balance for uh, legal services OM account. Uh, and there second. Was second. Yep. So made uh, and seconded here. Um, any any further discussion on this? Uh, roll call, please, Mary. Yes. 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 Councilor Adams? Yes. Councilor Carter? Yes. We'll suspend rule 14. A uh, motion's been made and we'll say seconded and uh, to suspend rules about second reading. Uh, all those in favor of suspending rules, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstention? To approve. Second. Uh, the motion's been made for the second reading and seconded. <coughs> Further discussion? <coughs> all those in favor, please say aye. 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 You, you need yeah. another, oh, I'm sorry. It's a roll call again. Roll again. <laughs> I'm sorry. Councilor Klein? Yes. Councilor Labarge? Yes. Yes. Councilor Yes. Councilor Carney? Yes. Yes. Next up is the financial order, the transfer of $300,000 for parking. Receipts reserved for appropriation of the general fund for replacement of parking access and revenue system at E.J. Garrick uh, parking garage. Move to approve. Second. Motions been made and seconded. Any discussion? Any further discussion? No. I'd just like to say that I'm actually very much in favor of this, and I think it, uh, it's more important that it's a point of service for the community, and that's where it's really failed. It's, it's been, service. yeah, it's been really frustrating for people to deal with and navigate, and creates subsequent headaches with all the other, with the park, all the people in charge. Of, have to deal with the issues that come up there and I think hopefully anything we can do to make it easier for people to come to the community and enjoy the community yep. it's all for the good um, <coughs> all those in favor please say aye aye, aye. no nope. fooled you roll call yes 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 suspend rule 14 second a motion made and seconded to suspend rules for second reading. All those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Any abstentions? Accept a motion for the second reading. So second. Seconded. Made and seconded. Um, any further discussion? 
roll call. <coughs> yes. 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 This is the uh, <laughs> second reading for the authorization to uh, Conservation Commission to purchase or otherwise acquire land at Broadbrook Gap. Move for approval. Second. Wave second reading. Okay, and there's a uh, request to waive the second reading. Yes. Okay, and everyone seems to be in accord with that. Uh, any discussion on this? Roll call, please, Mary. Councilor O'Donnell? Yes. 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 Okay. Um, okay. I'll try and multitask here. I'll pass it to the right foot. Um, Next up, yeah, there's a two okay, sheets. Yeah. Please sign two sheets. This is um, second reading for the authorization of acquisition of easement at uh, Foley Trust, 50 <coughs> Godfrey Street by gift purchase or other. Move to approve. Second it. Seconded. Any further discussion on this issue? Two sheets, sir. Yes. 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 On the third page, and the end is in sight. We're on ordinances. <coughs> this is second reading to amend. Chapter 280-1 through 280-12, adding the stormwater and flood control utility ordinance. Second reading. So moved. 13, I'm sorry. Second. Thank you. Uh, the motion's made to put it on the floor and second it. <coughs> so I know we're all tired now, trying to keep this short, but a couple of comments were made in public session. I would just want to address those. First, the, the, there was a change, I just want to make clear, there was the last minute, I think a number of us saw the whole issue about whether there would be a cap or not came forward. But let's be clear, this was a sidebar of a pretty big ordinance. This was not the essence of that ordinance. This was one small piece of that ordinance. It did have some significance, and I want to make sure I defend some fellow counselors who made a statement, but I don't think they were making that statement that they didn't understand the whole ordinance. They're making a statement that one piece of that came forward and they wish they had more time to look at that. And that's the very reason why we have two readings. So the implication, which was made by a couple of people, that the counselors didn't even read this, they didn't understand it. I know that I went to many, many presentations, as did every counselor here. And I think that this is an ordinance which counselors understand way more than a lot of things that come through. And so the implication was that we, we still don't, aren't clear about it. It was one specific part of that ordinance, and we've had a f the last couple of weeks to think about it. And that's the benefit of having a second reading. I mean, I've never been on any voting body before in my life where we've had two readings. But here's one where we do, and here's where it's been valuable to have something like that. And so if for those counselors who feel that that one piece the cap was so important to this ordinance that they feel they can no longer support it. Okay, they've had time to think about it and can do that. But I don't think it's a question that counselors don't understand the ordinance and were confused by it. That's number one. The second point that was made was uh, in public <coughs> session, a former member of the task force said that there was a piece of this where it was too complicated for the public to understand. I want to make sure we all understand what the task force was referring to. What they were referring to were engineering hydraulic models of how we should set the fee. And in fact, I've been to, I think it was 14 meetings. I've gone through this stuff. I'm not an engineer. I think, I think actually Council of Barge went to more meetings than I did. I still don't understand the engineering hydraulic models, but I do understand this ordinance. And that's what it was referring to. It was not saying that the whole thing was too complicated 
for the public to understand. That was a very cynical statement. So I just wanted to clarify that. I think counselors here have done an amazing job of going to multiple presentations about this particular ordinance. And I want to thank all of them, including myself, for doing that. And so I think we've had an amazing amount <coughs> of information, knowledge. We've asked questions. Uh, the, I want to thank the Board of Public Works because they've been there. Many of us have, have gone to multiple meetings and have heard statements made. I also want to say one other thing because it was addressed sp specifically to me. There was one small part of this ordinance which had to do with whether the city should pay the stormwater fee. And um, as Councillor Dwight knows, I, I was at these meetings and people would come and say, it's only fair that the city should pay the fee. The city, and I kept trying to say, we are the city. So if the city pays the fee, it's going to be reflected in our tax bill anyway. And I actually did not support that the city should pay that fee because actually it would have been spread out, but it's a very, very tiny amount that it would change this. If this, this is, so I was going to introduce an amendment tonight that the city not pay the fee, but I'm not going to do that because the amount we are talking about here is so insignificant. But in principle, the city paying the fee is still us paying the fee. And I just think it made people who were Oh, boy, the city should pay its fair share. And I just, so I just want that understood because it was said as if I was the one backing that and I was not. Uh, Councilor Murphy, then Councilor Adams, then Councilor Connor. <coughs> as to the city paying that fee, I believe when all is said and done, the city's contribution by paying the fee to the stormwater fund will be considerably less than what we're now spending out of the general fund budget on stormwater because there is no other source of money for stormwater. So it actually results in a reduction of general fund support because the fee is going to be lower than the money that's now being spent for that. Um, the other thing I wanted to point out is there was some talk about, you know, when did the solicitor get involved in this and discover that uh, perhaps the way we worded that, uh, that cap would not get by the Department of Revenue. The Ordinance Committee didn't deal with it until February 25th or something like that. That's not, that's uh, not true. At, the, at, at what I thought was a very well-attended meeting where the public had one more round at it made a lot of comments so it wasn't all of the components in the amendments Not weren't true. homogenized into one ordinance <coughs> until the 25th at which point then the solicitor looked at it and said oh I got a problem with this one uh, and the first reading came up like a week later a little over a week later so there wasn't a lot of time in between the ordinance actually being finished and when the solicitor looked at it and it came to us the last time so not a, lot of, not a lot of time in between finishing the ordinance after that last, last public meeting and when it came to council. Uh, the other thing that I wanted to mention about the cap, we're a living cap for this. I mean, the cap may not be on the mayor putting his budget together, but not only do we approve that enterprise fund, but we also improve the entire budget. So if this body says it's $2 million, it's going to be $2 million no matter what the mayor decides he wants to spend. Um, and if we decide that a hurricane comes through and takes out a chunk of the dike and the money to fix that has to come from somewhere because the dike is decertified because of the damage, well, then we go there. But as long as we have the resolve to say it's $2 million, that's all it's ever going to be. The cap maybe made people feel better, but we're the ones that say $2 million, no more. And as long as we do that, then there is a cap. Councillor Adams, then Councillor Carnes. My, my <coughs> few, few points, just um, addressing some of the things we heard from public comment. There was no conspiracy to give um, the chamber an, an inordinate amount of say in this process. Um, and also there was suge a suggestion that Councillor Specter um, somehow orchestrated that. Um, the Councillor Specter, myself, and Councillor Dwight um, sort of created the outline for the process. And when we created the idea of the task force, the idea was that different members of the council and different other entities would appoint members to the task force. And I don't think anyone got together to decide that they should have you know, a certain number of chamber members on it. That I just don't agree with that. Um, <coughs> one gentleman in the public comment said that the city will pay nothing under this ordinance. He kept saying that. He's completely incorrect. Um, he must not have been following this. But. Um, also, I just want to point out, I think Council Respector did, it's still not to change the, this. I mean, it seems like there's a lot of opposition on the Council to the mandate to the city paying. It's still not too late, too late to do that. I have an amendment that I'm presenting tonight. It's just not too late to do that. I do want to talk about the cap process. I drafted the cap amendment. I disagree that it was minor. I think it was extremely important. And I think a lot of people agree with me on that. 
I did it last fall. I presented it to numerous committees, and it was in all the presentations given to the public. And also, um, Councillor Murphy, frankly, it's, it's, it's incorrect that the solicitor got it in February. I presented it when I was still in ordinance. Mm -hmm. I presented it back then, and the solicitor was absent at that meeting as well. So, I mean, this first made its way to ordinance back last term when I was still on the committee. So that's just not the case. Um, Rule 36 was not followed. Um, and I was, I was extremely disappointed to wake up the day of the ordinance, uh, the first vote, and find out that it was illegal. I mean, I, I drafted that thing last fall, and I first presented it to ordinance <coughs> last term. So, I mean, it, it, it happened. Um, but I do want to point out it doesn't nullify any votes taken. It doesn't make the ordinance illegal. Um, and, and, and I think there's a distinction here. The council process was, I do think, exemplary. I think that we did outreach that, we pr that has, probably hasn't been seen before in any issue. Um, in recent memory, if there was a problem, with, if there was a problem with the process, and it was, it was that it's the solicitor's failure to follow Rule 36, and I hope we address that. That's a different branch. That's the executive branch. So for those people critical of the process, they should focus that criticism where it's rightly deserved. But um, just my final thoughts are, you know, st this the fee is needed, and um, I, I appreciate the process concerns. This we've done nothing illegal. And you know, I, using the, the process as, as a way to thwart the final outcome is not a solution, as Mr. Lapiansky stated. Um, the only other thing to do was nothing, and that's certainly not a solution. So those are my final thoughts. Thank you. Councilor Carney, and then Councilor Lubart. Okay. <clears throat> my comments really are related to the, um, to the exemption piece as well. And we, we heard um, all throughout this process, uh, everyone pays. Everyone pays, and that's everyone. Um, and that was the justification for why, uh, why the city should pay. And while I'm not prepared to offer an amendment to <coughs> strike that language, um, and mostly because this was something that did go through all of the neighborhood meetings and all of the, you know, the, <coughs> the chambers subcommittee and everyone else and did come back, it has always, it, you know, throughout the process seemed, um, uh, somewhat confusing to have that language that said that the city should pay as an example of how everyone, uh, because everyone pays. Because in fact, yes, everyone pays, but some people pay twice. And that's what this is, and that's what happens in this case. When we say that the city pays, or the city property is, is also assessed, homeowners pay on their own homes, on their, on their own property business owners as well on their property, and then they pay again by virtue of the taxes that they pay to the general fund. So I found that it was really important to clarify that, and that's why I offered that amendment at the last meeting, just to really um, <coughs> distinguish, to, to really uh, make it clear that when we say the city, we're saying the taxpayers. And that's the only comment I wanted to make tonight. Council Labar. <coughs> yes. Um, I just want to echo what Councillor Adams had just stated. I also attended that ordinance committee meeting. And, and I have to say, Jesse, Councillor Adams, his amendment was placed in the fall, came into ordinance that night, and no city solicitor there. And I'm concerned about this. I'm really concerned about that Rule 36. It bothers me. And I am hoping next time, whenever we have anything coming in that is of a lot of value, especially money coming out of people's pockets, I have great concerns. I really feel as city councilors, it is our job. Two readings is two readings. I agree with you, Councilor Spector. But we could have had a meeting in between just to educate the taxpayers. I don't find that to be a problem. I think the process was excellent through the Board of Public Works. I think there was a, a tremendous amount of communication, but I can't tell you as a city councilor on my ward how many calls I have gotten within the past two weeks of people who were really supporting this because of that five-year cap. And then all of a sudden, things have changed. Just that one meeting would have meant a lot to a lot of people of trust, 
of trust. And I'm hoping that we really look at this because people are not happy in this city. I'm gonna support this, but I am really questioning this Rule 36 and the procedure on how it was done. Councilor Spector. So, uh, changing the topic, I have a, what is hopefully a friendly amendment. Okay. To <laughs> um, and can I read the amendment? Please. Okay. The Department of Public Works shall be strongly encouraged to bear witness to the needs of bicyclists, pedestrians, and people using mobility devices, and shall be further encouraged to consider their needs on an equitable basis in conjunction with the needs of motorists, business owners, and others, both during the construction of any projects funded in whole or in part by the stormwater and flood control utility in regard to the design <coughs> of the finished product. And I want to thank Councilor Adams for suggesting, good lawyer, to suggest where this would go. This would be under 280-8E. So it's just a way of encouraging, it's, as you say, the language there is just saying we strongly encourage that those things be taken into account um, when looking at, at funding projects. Do you have the language? I do. Is, is there a second on that amendment? Second. second. Discuss the uh, amendment. Uh, just, just a question. Can you give me an example of how bicycles and pedestrians would be affected by the stormwater system? Well, if you're redesigning a, a sidewalk, for example, because of the stormwater, you want to make sure that you use some of those funds and say we're going to... During construction? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, you, you just take it into account that even during construction, you take into account that there are people who are coming by. I, I would imagine that the purpose of this amendment is just sort of emphasize it's not the presumption that they normally ignore. Not at all. That it's just saying take it into account, don't ignore it. But. Right. That, that, that it's, it's probably maybe even part of the policy that exists already, it, but you I just assume want to it is. It. But uh, I, was, I was asked to introduce that, and I thought it was a friendly. Uh, two, it says it says where it is at the bottom, 280-8E. Yes. 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 As Article E? Article E. Any other discussion on the amendment? Councilor Adams? I'm sorry, not that amendment. No. Sounds good. All those in favor of the amendment, please say aye. 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 Oh, no, I'm sorry. Need a roll? Not for the amendment, I think. There's no money. No, we're, no, not we're okay. Might as well. letting Mary catch up here. Oh. I, I, I do want to roll call on that, yes. 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 When you read your amendment, would you change it to July 1, 2015? Or 14? When is this? It's fiscal year 15. Well, the but it's July 14, so you're correct. Sorry about that. I kept just thinking the next fiscal year. Right, right, right. I guess. What are your um, That's why it's a little it, the, the, um, We amended the, the, the credit section last time, and it was a little, at reading it the way we amended it, I just thought it was a little bit confusing. Um, I thought it's sort of, it basically it said, DPW is in couple of the credit system, council can change them, the mayor can change them. Just, I thought there needed to be a little more clear, and actually I worked on this with the city solicitor to come up with this language, which I think makes it very clear how it'll work. Um, the Board of Public Works shall develop a proposed stormwater management and flood control utility credit policy, credit policy, mm -hmm. by July 1st, 2014. The board shall submit the proposed credit policy to the mayor, who may approve, modify, and approve or disprove the credit policy. The credit policy, as approved by the mayor, shall be submitted by the mayor to the city council for approval. The city council may approve or disapprove the credit policy as submitted. So it's just a very, I mean, it just, it just clarifies it. Just How full great. And, um, so and the, the amendment moves. Yeah, I'm sorry, that'll be um, 280 10. It'll be delete the first sentence. and replace that sentence with these three sentences. Mm -hmm. And then the rest of my amendment is delete section F entirely. Is there a second? Second. second. Uh, Councilor Murphy. Oh, just a question. We, we're assuming this, this is 
for the initial implementation that this time frame is set up for to get it ready for when it starts. How about amending the policy? Is that dealt with, do you recall, elsewhere in the, you know, if let's say, you know, three years in, DPW chooses to amend the policy, does this require the same procedure? Yes, it, that's, it that's my same. So this yeah. simply says it will be done for July 1 right out of right. starting off. And right. after that, it could be amended through the same process. Yeah, I believe, um, yeah, if I could just pull up a little time. Yeah, it doesn't state, I see what you're saying. It doesn't state expressly if, if this is supposed to happen at future points. Um, I mean, it's my intent that it does, but. I mean, I can understand for the public, when the bills start going out, we want the credit policy defined so that if people want to use it right away, they can. But down the road, if they want to change it, you know, every couple of years, depending on experience or if they find there's a flaw on it or something, I assume it would be the same procedure. Mm -hmm. Here, I could, I, I could address that, I think. <coughs> this language, sorry, if, if I could just, shall be developed and from time to time amended. Um, shall be, shall, shall develop, propose, and from time to time amend. That takes the language from the original one. What about amend is needed? Yes, needed. Uh, Councilor O'Donnell to the amendment. Um, would you consider, um, as, as a friendly change, saying the board shall <coughs> annually submit the proposed <coughs> credit policy to the mayor? In other words, as part of the annual budget, budget process. That way, in addition to what you have just added to your amendment, just the word yeah, annually. That so that yes. there's. That would, where, where, where specifically would you put it? I guess I would put the word. And I don't know if we want to deal with your amendment first. Uh, we, we put the word annually uh, after the word shall. The board that, shall that, annually that, submit. That that yeah. Thank you, Councillor. That's, that's a friendly amendment, uh, addition of the amendment. Can someone read the full amendment as, it, it, as everyone now understands it? The Board, of Public Work, the Board of Public Works shall annually develop a proposed stormwater management and flood control utility credit policy by July 1st, 2014. The board shall submit the proposed credit policy to the mayor who may approve, modify, and approve, or disapprove the credit policy. The credit policy as approved by the mayor shall be submitted by the mayor to the city council for approval. The city council may approve or disapprove the credit policy as submitted. You don't need the July. I think right. if it's annually at this point, you don't need that, that date certain at this point. So that was 2014. Yeah, anymore. Right. Okay. Yeah, um, so delete by delete. July 1st. I believe to 2014 by July. Yeah, 2014. Good point. Yeah. yeah. Well, Councilor O'Donnell. But is that accurate? Is, is July 1st when this July. should That's be developed? Yeah. That's when the budget. start of each new fiscal year. Right. So, but isn't it the case that that's when it must be approved by? So the development might happen before. So it might be cleaner just to remove the month. Oh, so just get rid of the date certain. Because the yeah, just get rid of the date certain and just have annually until. Right. Yeah, oh, you, how about um, just that period after credit policy by July 1st, 2014, deleted? So the concept will be annually when DPW submits its proposed budget, part of that is either the same credit policy that they've been using or a new version of it based on their experience, but the budget and the credit policy would come to us together <coughs> and we'd approve it every year, you know, at right. the same time. Mm -hmm. Councilor O'Donnell. But just uh, as a book end, I mean, the, the mayor is the one who submits the budget, so I would defer to what you think would be the well, It's due to you by usually May 15th. To be, I mean, it's due to you 45 days prior to the start of the fiscal year. Okay. Um, but if I needed a little bit of time to review it, maybe it would be, I mean. So it's okay just to remove the month? And I think it would be fine. I mean, I think, the, I think it'll be expected that it'll come as part of the, uh, part of the enterprise fund budget. So you're suggesting that the mayor will 
modify or amend and will it will be given to the city council for final approval but it doesn't say anything about modification there Do, does the council not have the power to modify, modify as well we sure can. well in the same way i think in the same way that you know the cap was it, it's the in issue the, is it's in the what I'm saying is in terms of language, it says language specifically that the mayor can modify, but it <coughs> doesn't say that the city council can. That's correct. I, I think right. it's right. intentionally That's that correct. It's, it's we the, can say yes or no. and then they, The issue is, of course, the, the same as they point out that came up before, is that we do not have the authority to limit the mayor's budgetary process. And, and when we put on caps or when we put on um, restrictions of any sort, we have the right to vote it up or down once right. it comes to it. But we can't modify and change those things. But we can certainly have influence. And again, once again, no authority but influence. So, um, and that, that's an important distinction. And I think coming out of, you know, <coughs> as I said, we, we did charter reform for several years and we came out uh, out of that process and uh, all a little wiser and then some of us still a little stupefied. And I will be one of those people. And we're still trying to comfortably adjust and accommodate that, <coughs> which is actually also speaks to the the issue about the cap. Um, any d more discussion on the amendment? Could someone read the amendment as it is now? The board shall submit the proposed credit policy to the mayor. Approve, modify it, and approve or disapprove the credit policy. Credit policy as approved by the mayor shall be submitted by the mayor to the city council for approval. The city council may approve or disapprove the credit policy as submitted and also delete section F. Um, so my understanding though was that we added from time to time. No, no. I think no. you're, I think you're, I think would you add, would you, would you did. And it's annual, it's really fine. Mandated yeah. that they'll do it yearly, yeah. I think. It must be really annoying. The annually belongs um, next to the first shall, or should, is it better? Is it better to say the board shall annually submit? You'd rather say the board shall annually develop rather than say the board shall annually submit. <coughs> <coughs> It's just a question. I, it's probably too. Uh, the, the submission charge is in the second sentence, of course. Uh, yeah. um, and I should say, in the context, this is the, the plan, as we heard from, as Jim testified last time, is to do on an ongoing basis, make adjustments and accommodations. And rather than prescribe something even more finite, uh, my guess is by the time they will be working on this process and then but it will be subject to approval by the mayor but it, it, they're already charged and it's it's their intent to do just that anyway what we're trying to torturously try to direct them to do so. um any more discussion on the amendment preference to be a roll call uh, roll call on the amendment please yes yes <coughs> yes. 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 All right, we're back to the main order. Um, any further discussion on that, please? Um, and it is late, it's 11.30, we're approaching another day. The uh, I do think it's important, and everyone has said, and and I think you know the process and the trust have been called into question. And I think it's worth addressing, um, and I think it comes from sort of a misunderstanding about process. Well, we've just done we just done a series of amendments, and we did a series of amendments at the last meeting as well, which is actually what this deliberative body is charged with doing. It, it, um, and. The, as far as the explanation to the community, I think Councilor Specker spoke to this quite appropriately. It's why we have two votes. It's why we have these separated by these meetings. An opportunity for councilors to speak with their constituents, do research and find out essentially what the issue is, and then in turn respond to the community <coughs> as, they, as the questions come up. 
the the issue about well, bait and switch was once asserted here. Um, we're actually we have to we, we take an oath to uphold the law and the constitution of the state. And point of fact, we were it was pointed out, albeit late, but it was still pointed out, and as Councilor Carnick pointed out, in time. Not <coughs> optimal time, but in time. For us to abide by the law and not make a, essentially an illegal document that would have eradicated this, the validity of this document. That's our job. That's what we're supposed to do. That's exactly what we're supposed to do. And at the same time, it is understood that you can't post anticipated amendments. Amendments sometimes come on the floor um, at the last minute. That is, and the purpose of that is, I mean, we're charged with trying to make the best document possible. And I think it's incumbent upon us, and even going forward as we go, is to is to continue to outreach. It doesn't end today with the yay vote. We have to continually go out, and at the same time, we have to be understand what it is we're doing, and what it is we have done, and be prepared to defend or explain, <coughs> or um, even apologize for what we've done. <coughs> but the fact is, is that it, with with a full breadth of knowledge and understanding that a lot of us have come to accumulate over this over this discussion, and I and I too took issue with any number of public comments because. Um, for a variety of reasons, I don't think that they were necessarily based, they were based on perception as opposed to based on fact. So I once again want to thank the council the way they've conducted themselves. I think you've done it more than honorably. I think you've done exactly what it is we were expected to do. And I'm really actually quite proud of this. All, the fact is I don't agree with a number of things about this. I just, as I said before with the bid debate, there's a whole, uh, the whole structure, the superstructure that is given to us by the state and federal authorities, I got issues with. But the fact is, given the constraints that we work under and the challenges that we face, this, we did our due diligence, we did our good faith um, outreach, we continue to do that, and if we have indeed lost the trust, then, then we've got some work to do. Um, but I hope that I hope that everyone understands that. I mean, I think that <coughs> no one gamed this, no one played us. Um, there may be some people who feel they have, but we should be proud of it. And uh, so I thank you as we go into this. Um, I have waived, of course, consideration of everyone on the planet Earth, the reading of the entire ordinance this time. I did read it in toto the last time. Sure. The amendments have been read. Um, the, the, the document is available online so that the public can review it and see, and it will be posted with the new amendments. Bless you. Uh, <laughs> you. And we'll, uh, it's available for the public to see. And in fact, Councilor O'Donnell has an amendment that requires a regular report on, on the internet, on the website as well in the interest of transparency. So, that said, anyone else have any other comments or thoughts on this article, on this ordinance establishing this enterprise? <coughs> Roll we'll call, please, Mary. Yes. 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 It's passed unanimously. <coughs> In second reading. Uh, this is upon recommendation of Councilor Jesse M. Adams uh, that the following changes to the city rules are adopted, and um, you might consider doing two readings on this one. Oh yes. Um, uh, Non-member attendance at committee at committee meetings. Councilors may attend council committee meetings. So they are not members of the committee and may sit in the audience and participate as members of the public. They may address the committee consistent with its rules and in the same manner, to the same extent as non-counselors attending the <coughs> meetings are allowed to address the committee. Such counselors in attendance at a committee meeting may state their opinion on matters under consideration by the committee, but they shall not discuss matters as a quorum, nor shall they discuss topics that are not under consideration by the committee. Accept the motion. So moved. Second. Second. Uh, Council items, uh, you've already spoken to this point. Due to the late hour, I waive any comments I'll make unless there are any questions. <laughs> any questions? Uh. 
Uh, who seconded that? I did. That is Councilor Labarge. Um, all those in favor, please say aye. Aye. I don't have a roll call. Yes. 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 Suspend rule 14. Second. Motion made and seconded to suspend rules. For all those in favor, please say yeah. aye. 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 And those opposed? Abstentions? Motion for second reading? Second. Any further discussion? Mary? Yes. 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 What's it to you? Piker, you're leaving. I'm just, just to extend Mary's stay with us, I'm going to leave this whole thing. Oh, stop it. <laughs> wave reading. <laughs> oh, it's been a request for wave reading, but this is again on the recommendation of Councillor Adams. Um, it's about the council rules about relevant to remote meeting participation. You'll recall the discussion yep. on that. Yep. Uh, this essentially allows us to take advantage of uh, the authorized use of remote participation in meetings under special circumstances. I'll accept a motion to put it on the floor. So, so moved. Second it. Uh, it. Motion made by Councilor Murphy, seconded by Councilor Klein. Uh, any further discussion? Yes. 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 Motion to suspend rules. I'll make that. What? I'll move. We suspend rule fourteen. She just did. So we'll call you. I'll second it. Okay. All right. Uh, the, discussion. Yeah. the discussion is simply <coughs> we're going to approve this, but when is the hocus Vote. pocus technology going to be in place for like a <laughs> monitor to be here to represent us? Because we obviously can't do this Six until times. we can do this. Well, the, uh, the rule the rules are specific and stipulate to what extent it's, so the public can actually hear the person. I mean, theoretically, we could do it with my laptop, turn it to the audience, and it's done as long as it's amplified adequately for the person. And we could do it with Skype. Does it have to be visual? I mean, it I thought it could also have a. It could also be by phone. Uh, uh, iPhone. Since we, yeah, iPhone's not going to count. Let's <laughs> put on the microphone. That's what I mean, you know. Like this. Well, we don't have the budget for that G Wood stuff yet. This is I, I've got the prospect. And it's not exclusive to. Uh, the council meetings, it's a, a subcommittee meetings as well. But it, I mean, it, it doesn't need to be discussed extensively tonight. But at some point, we're going to have to decide when we're up to speed yes. for it. Yeah. And I, I anticipate that the rules will change as the technology changes. Um, Next. Any further discussion? We haven't voted, Paul. We haven't voted. Councillor Adam has made the motion. I th Right, or Council LaBarge made the motion originally, and then seconded by Council Murphy. That was to suspend rules. You're right. And all those in favor of suspending rules? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Okay. How's their motions? Councilor. Second reading. Seconded by Councilor Spector. Yes. 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 How's everyone doing? We're going to get before midnight. Uh, this is upon the recommendation of transportation parking. This is uh, the ordinance of the city of Northampton providing the code of ordinances of the city of Northampton be amended by revising 312-36 uh, of said code providing the parking meter <laughs> locations and regulations. Um, uh, da, 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 amend. Notwithstanding subsection E of this section under special circumstances or in co uh, connection with a special event, the Transportation and Parking Commission by majority vote may alter the fee structure for the E.J. <coughs> e. John Gare, uh, uh, the third parking garage for a period not to exceed five days. 
if collecting, and then with the new language, if collecting established fees is impractical due to repair or replacement of machine parts or infrastructure, the mayor may temporarily alter fees for any municipal lot or metered space for a period not extending beyond the next city council meeting, after which altered fees shall revert to original fees. The mayor shall immediately write a letter to the city uh, council president explaining the reasons behind the alterations, and the city council may vote to extend, modify, or reverse the alteration of fees at any time. Is there a motion? Some move to put this on floor? Second? Second. We're going to die here. Shit. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Councilor Adams, I have a question. Um, what's the difference between? I mean, I see one. I see one side. There's a difference in sponsors. Are, are there any other differences? Uh, Councilor Don, you want to speak to this? I can answer that. Um, it was simply rewritten. And that's the that's the biggest difference for a decision. Um, yeah. I'm trying to see if there are any other differences to highlight. How is the, the original sponsor, the former councilor? who drafted it got dumped as a sponsor. It was uh, suggested he be kindly and gently dumped uh, by, it might have been our, our, our able council clerk, um, just because he no longer exists as a counselor. So he was remained, I mean, we could add him back if you want to add, you know, amend Not about him. Yeah. <laughs> What's his name? <laughs> <laughs> so. Uh, He's there in spirit, I assure you. <laughs> I, and we should send him a, a postcard, he's should this pass. Yeah, he's not worried about it. <laughs> Move the question. Uh, roll call, please. Yes. 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 So that's first reading. You'll have an opportunity to revisit that. Uh, this is also, this is first reading. Also, this is a, uh, with a positive recommendation from ordinance. Um, this is a fee structure for certain permits to be simplified. Uh, wave reading, please. Um, I'll accept the motion. You, for explain this right you guys are buttoning up. I need a motion to put it on the floor so here. Oh, second. second. <laughs> <It's> <laughs> Councilor Murphy. And I just w I want to read one part of it because Mr. Fiden couldn't be here tonight, so I I told him I would just point out the fact. Um, that all this is doing is incorporating miscellaneous fees that are now added up and charged into one fee. So the city would charge an application fee, <coughs> plus they make the person pay for an ad in the Gazette, uh, and then also registry recording fees when the things have to be recorded. So rather than charging the application fee, and then a la carte for the publishing, and then a la carte for the recording, they'll charge one fee and then they'll pay for the advertising and the recordings and the mailings. So rather than you're having to pay one fee to the city and one fee to the Gazette and one fee to the registry, you'll pay the total to the city and then the city will pay at each of those steps for those other things. That actually makes it a lot easier for them. It does. <laughs> <laughs> and Mr. Viden said if you, you want to talk to him about it, he'd be here for a second <coughs> reading, but that's, that's what he's doing he's is simplifying. Morning, Ten minutes and he can That's true. Wait till he clocks in. I think it would have been an app punishment to Wayne to have him actually wait for this all the way tonight. Yes. So that concludes my explanation. Any further discussion on this? Yes. 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 Passes in first reading and be revisited. First meeting in April. I have no updates. I have a lengthy list of updates I'd like to go through. Sure, and you also have an opportunity for information requests. Do you want to do any? You have any information requests? Any new business? I sure as hell didn't anticipate any. So, move to adjourn. It's a motion made to adjourn. Is there a second? Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you all very. much.